This is the California State Senate. If we can start taking our seats, we welcome you. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Well, good evening. On behalf of Supervisor Bass, we are grateful. Grateful that you took the time to join us for our second town hall on California's opioid crisis. Uh, before we get into this evening's meeting, we want to start with a moment of silence. Uh, we lost a, a titan in this incredible community with the passing of Dr. Herman Spetzler, the founder and CEO of Open Door Community Health Center here a few weeks ago. Uh, Herman expanded health care on the North Coast like no other, and it was through his visionary leadership and hard work, a commitment to collaboration, and his love to community that Open Door is now a model of success for successful rural health care delivery here in California. And we're going to ask each of you to please take a moment to be able to uh, bow our heads in his honor. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We, again, are truly grateful that you would join us for this important community conversation tonight. Um, my name is Mike McGuire, and I'm honored to be able to work with you and represent the North Coast and Humboldt County and the State Senate. And I'm grateful to be partnering with Supervisor Virginia Bass tonight on this community conversation. The, opi the opioid crisis has impacted Humboldt and the North Coast region worse than many others of this state. And I think many of you may agree with me this evening. This community is coming from behind on combating this epidemic. This means people have a right. People have an absolute right to be extremely frustrated, pissed off, and many are desperate for treatment. The solutions that are going to be advanced have this community split. There are very few challenges that have brought out such emotion. And it's because this issue is so personal, so many people, for so many reasons. There have been several challenges that have been advanced since our last time we got together in November. And here's a quick synopsis. We've heard loud and clear, some don't want or don't agree with methadone as a viable treatment for opioid addiction. Others are concerned that more Suboxone treatment will lead to black market street trading. Some believe that enhanced treatment availability in Humboldt County is an enabler. The more slots or the more beds we have, the more people will come to our hometown. Some don't want privately owned addiction treatment centers to come into the community. There are other neighbors that are deeply concerned that Needle exchange programs do more harm than good. Regardless of what your opinion may be tonight, all opinions are welcome this evening. But the bottom line is this. Some may not be happy with all or some of the solutions that will be advanced this evening and in the months to come. And the bottom line, if we're being honest, our job, myself and Supervisor Bass, our job is not to make everyone happy. Our job is to find solutions that will help people kick this addiction that has been called the worst addiction crisis in American history. Our job is to clean up the streets of syringe letter. Our job is to deliver as many resources as possible, to steer as many dollars as possible to humble communities in the North Coast. Our job is to better manage syringe distribution. Our job is to go after the pharmaceutical industry and hold them accountable for so many who are addicted. Our job is to get the job done. And the unfortunate fact about this crisis, there is not going to be an easy solution, and it's going to take time. 
That said, uh, we started to turn the corner and progress is being made. The Eureka City Council passed a first of its kind ordinance which mandates syringe exchange programs report back to the city on numbers of syringes given out, referrals made, and that weekly cleanups take place. And we have several city council members here this evening. We want to thank, say thank you for attending. Number two, a community coordinator and education position will soon be hired to coordinate syringe litter pickups, coordinate the efforts of all treatment uh, providers and secure grants and outreach efforts and work with the community on the opi opioid cri crisis. Aegis will be opening up later this year which will be able to serve a minimum of 200 patients in the beginning and expand their patient numbers between Humboldt, Del Norte, and Trinity in the months and years to come. The county's syringe drop-off locations have opened up and it's picked up over 120 pounds of syringe litter between January 1st and March 7th. The city of Eureka has now opened up six syringe drop-off locations at six different city locations all throughout Eureka. And of course, Hatcher continues their community cleanup efforts as well. We've begun working with the city of Eureka on launching a downtown streets team. San Rafael and San Jose have launched their streets team and they've been incredibly successful. They hire homeless residents to pick up trash and beautify the downtown. Team members, all homeless, outreach to other homeless residents to join the downtown streets team to discourage loitering as well as disorderly conduct. They provide job skills and help homeless residents gain security and break the cycle of homelessness and improve our community all at the same time. And we're advancing an $8.4 million budget request to implement what we call SBIRT, screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment in all emergency rooms all throughout California. All data points show early identification of addiction for patients shows greater success long term. If an individual enters an emergency room at St. Joe's and they are suspected to be under the influence of methamphetamine, opioids, or heroin, they will go through the SBIRT process and be directed to a treatment program. There's also a slew of legislative bills that are moving forward even as we speak to combat opioid abuse and this crisis that has hit every corner of this state. I'm gonna finish here and turn it over to our co-host, Supervisor Bass. This is a massive challenge. And this challenge has impacted cities big and small all across America. But if we look at where the impact has been the most significant, it's in rural communities and small counties. The easiest approach for all of us tonight would be to turn our backs. Turn our backs like so many communities have done across America. But I believe we're gonna refuse to do that. It's not gonna be easy. And in fact, this issue will get ugly. And we've seen some of that already here in Humboldt. That said, there are very few communities, very few, in this state and throughout our nation that have the courage to step up and solve this crisis. And Humboldt has that courage. Again, I know that we're not always gonna agree tonight. And we're not always gonna agree in the months to come. But together, we can solve this crisis and we can't afford to wait. I now like to better turn it over to Supervisor Bass for opening remarks. And thank you again for being here tonight. All right, thank you. I'm How to work the microphone, I guess. Um, how many of you are first time at this? I mean, you weren't at the last event. Is this your first opioid town hall? I've got one. I know there's more. That's great. Thank you for being here because when you're here, you're actually part of the solution and part of the discussion. And um, I really appreciate that you're here today. You know, we have to do this together. This is not something that the city council can solve, or the board of supervisors, or the senator, you know, it takes all of us. And um, I do appreciate the work you're going to do in the months ahead, and actually years ahead, if we are really honest with ourselves. It's hard to believe that four months have passed. And not a day goes by lately where someone's not coming up to me and saying, nothing's changed. No one's doing anything. 
I get it, they're totally frustrated. I am too, you know, I like quick results. It's like you go on a diet, I don't wanna wait a month to lose two pounds. You know, I want it now. And, but it doesn't always happen that way. Um, I spent a lot of time in the last week talking to county supervisors throughout California and some across the nation. Um, they're dealing with the same issue that we are. And several of them are having a measure of success. And so I said, what is it you're doing that we're not? You know, what is, what is that piece we're missing? And I didn't get the answer I wanted. You know, I got the answer that I actually expected. Um, there's no, sil no magic bullet, there's no magic wand, and there's not one defining moment where everything clicks into place. Their communities started out going through a very painful process, exactly like what we're doing here. If it's any consolation, you know, we are actually on the right path. They're ahead of us in the curve of making things happen, but only because they began before us. So there's no reason that we can't take what we've learned from others and actually start making a real difference in our community. And that's why I really appreciate all of you who are here. Before we go to the panelists, um, I want to share a few things that are happening because we keep hearing nothing's happening, so there is things happening. Uh, at the last meeting, we had a lot of conversations about children. You know, what are we doing upstream? What are we doing to prevent kids from, from being trapped in this cycle? And so one of the things I wanted to bring up is we're investing lots of money across the um, spectrum of substance abuse, whether it's prevention or treatment. And Measure S in specific, the local cannabis tax, is providing $400,000 to First Five and a dozen other local nonprofits to, to keep children from experiencing adverse childhood events. We know that people who experience those are more likely to go down the line of substance abuse. So we have to stop it somewhere. The goal is to build resiliency in children and stop that generational cycle of substance abuse. Speaking of youth, um, there are many youth locally who have put forward recommendations of how we can better serve um, the youth in our community in the health care continuum. Um, okay, I just used the acronym, it's HCTAC, but let me actually read the whole thing. It's a mouthful. Humboldt County Transition Age Youth Collaboration members, also known as HCTAC, um, have done an amazing job coming together and bringing ideas forward of how we can better serve our local youth in the community and how we can better treat them. And they are here in the audience, and I would like to have them raise their hands or stand up. Where are they? <laughs> okay. Well, just saying, you know, you're, thank you. You are the future leaders, and we need you, and thank you for being involved in your community. And we're doing some different things. One, ex one example is the Family Wellness Court, and which will provide um, a partnership with the York Tribe, uh, the Humboldt Courts, uh, Superior Court, and uh, DHHS and Child uh, Welfare Services, which is a direct response to the local opioid crisis. Uh, the Family Wellness Court will provide an alternative to foster care by addressing the root causes of drug use, truancy, and other challenges while children actually remain in the home. This means they don't get removed from their families, and this keeps families together, which is really important. And I'd like to shout out to Judge Heinrichs, who is in the room somewhere as well. Where? There she is. Okay. Um, you know, she is spearheading this, and she's got so much energy, and she's great to have on our side. So I, I, look, I look forward to hearing more about that program. And then lastly, um, if any of you were watching our board meeting, I, I hope you have better things to do than watch our board meeting during the day or in the middle of the night when you're not sleeping, that happens too. Uh, we did file suit against um, Big Pharma. We're joining um, at least 300 communities who are doing the same. Uh, we can certainly, I think we can do this as a community. And you know, we're already asking, you know, making changes in how people prescribe. But we, yeah, thank you. But we also deserve to have our communities made whole to some extent because we have a lot of broken people because of this industry. And so it's time that they pay the piper and help us get, you know, get back in line and, and you know, 
Hopefully they'll learn not to do that again, but I think it's something to really watch because if it happened once before, it can happen again. So let's not let that, let's not go down that path. So basically, those are the remarks I wanted to begin with, and I will turn this back to the senator. Thank you very much, Supervisor. Uh, before we get into our two panels, we'd like to be able to acknowledge all the elected officials that we he have here tonight. Of course, we have several members of the Eureka City Council who have been working hard for us day in and day out, uh, along with Sheriff Hansel. If we could have all of our elected officials please stand and let's give them a round of applause and please say thank you uh, for all of your work. Right over here, Council Member Vigel, Allison, thank you. Thank you so much. We'd like to be able to take care of some housekeeping quickly. Uh, we have two panels for you this evening. We're going to be hearing a progress report from each of the treatment providers that we heard from last time. We're then going to be jumping into an in-depth discussion on harm reduction and syringe and needle dis exchange and disposal. We'll be kicking off that panel with Dr. Karen Mark, who's chief of the Office of AIDS for the state of California. She will be broadcasting via Skype. Um, we're going to be uh, having her kick us off here in just a bit for that second panel. What we'd like to be able to ask, if everyone's comfortable with this, to be able to leave as much time as possible for conversation here tonight, we'd like to be able to get through each of our panelists uh, and then turn it over to all of you, which is the most important part of tonight, is from hearing from you. There's going to be just two exceptions to that, if it's okay with you. Dr. Karen Mark, she will be on the video. She will uh, give her report, and then we're going to open it up for questions, because then we have to uh, make room for Pete Nielsen uh, in regards to sober living environments, who will also be on Skype. Does that sound okay for, for folks? All right. So without further ado, we'd like to be able to get a progress report from North Coast Treatment Providers. We're going to kick it off with Dr. Uh, uh, Julie Onimus, the Associate Corporate Medical Director from Open Door Community Health Centers. She has about six minutes to be able to give a report, and I will give her a quick 30-second heads up. Let's give the doctor a warm welcome. Good evening. I'm a family physician and board certified in addiction medicine. And I've been a provider for buprenorphine for almost 12 years now, and a member of this community for 27. I've been asked to share updates about Open Doors, buprenorphine program, and some observations that I've had in my role. But let me first say, what I'm observing is a lot of suffering in all sides of the opiate crisis narrative. And when there's suffering, I primarily rely on active listening to the individual's story and education. That's why I'm grateful for this coming together and our, our ability to say, share our conversation and commitment on the, a, a dire topic such as this. Open Doors buprenorphine program is currently serves 680 plus patients across six of our sites. We have buprenorphine programs in Arcata, Eureka, Willow Creek, Fortuna, and Del Norte. We average 10 to 15 new patients every week. They enter through self-referral or referral from outside sources. We recently started a discussion around the transition of patients from waterfront uh, so that there's a smooth transition from inpatient services to outpatient services so people don't fall through the cracks. Over the last number of years, we've had 30 plus moms deliver their babies within our Suboxone program. And as some of you may know, when there's usage of any opiate, whether it's heroin, Norco, uh, Suboxone, or Methadone, the baby's at risk for withdrawal once delivered. And so this occurs about 20% of the time. So we're in the process of looking at outcomes of the babies uh, who have been delivered within our program to better educate ourselves, our community, as well as our hospitals. There's two different models within our programs in Open Door. It's, there's a standalone Suboxone model where MAT services are their primary focus, and then there's a Suboxone program embedded uh, with primary care services. Data shows that people with substance use disorders die 26 years earlier than their cohorts, and this is from physical causes. So if we can address their comorbidities at the same place that they provide, that we provide their addiction services, then um, that not only provides one-stop shopping, but it also builds that relationship between patient and provider and treating the whole person. In both these models, we have just begun offering the curative hepatitis C treatment for those who qualify, and we're investigating sublucade, which is actually the injectable monthly um, depot form of buprenorphine. 
Our buprenorphine programs have a, a very broad and intense psychosocial program. We're looking to expand the number of substance abuse counselors. We're offering evidence-based model called Seeking Safety for those with co-occurring substance use disorder and uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. In addition, we use cognitive behavioral therapy, mo motivational interviewing, and mindfulness. After our patients undergo uh, induction with Suboxone, they enter those phases. Phase one is for just beginning where the neurochemicals of their brain need to reestablish some balance, and they are at higher risk for relapse. Phase two and three, you enter those and you're more stable in your life, you've been clean, and you have an advancement in the developing of your coping skills. Phase three also invi involves maintenance therapy. Over the 12 years of our experience in conjunction with the evidence-based science of addiction, it's now being shown that addiction is a, a chronic brain disease and not a moral weakness or a lack of willpower. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> there are individuals who are prone to addiction through their genetics and after repetitive exposure to the abuse substance such as heroin, or prescription opioids, there are some permanent changes in the brain. These structural and chemical changes in the brain are then stimulated by stress hormones that you and I and everyone produce when we're stressed. The difference is the effects of these chemicals are turned off in those who do not have addiction and while they are amplified and continue to act in the addicted brain. This amplified activity leads to relapse. Study after study has shown that the high rate of relapse is 90 to 95 percent for people with addiction. And so the field of addiction of medicine has recommended maintenance therapy, where, uh, whether it's with Suboxone, Naltrexone, or Methadone for the majority of individuals with opiate addiction. And I wouldn't stop someone, uh, insulin on any one of my patients with diabetes, the blood pressure medications for anybody with blood, uh, hypertension, and so I'm not going to stop Suboxone for those who have the chronic disease of addiction, if that's their goal. As a primary care provider, I want to make another observation in the opioid crisis, and that's regard to chronic pain. Individuals with chronic pain have been swept up in the opioid crisis with some unintended consequences. The evidence changed from liberal use to the evidence that high doses cause uh, harm. Uh, certainly affecting those with the vulnerable brains uh, from their genetics, as well as causing hyperalgesia or increased sensitivity uh, to pain, so that if you use these opiates, then your pain actually gets worse. I think it's hard for any profession to accept that they certainly were wrong in the first angle of their treatment. We were just following the evidence, but we realized um, that this is not the first time that's happened. If you think back in 2000, uh, at that point we were prescribing the majority of postmenopausal estrogen, and then the new evidence came out, um, and we were doing that for 40 years, and the new evidence came out and we stopped. But because there was no public health crisis on estrogen, the transition to prescribing women's hormones was more individualized, graduated, and educated. Give about I, one minute, doctor, I apologize. Okay, what has been hard is the intersection of the new evidence, the opioid crisis, increased legislation and scrutiny, and honestly, the emotional well-being of providers. And so that pendulum of change swung quickly and far. And unfortunately, out of a sense of desperation to maintain their function, we are seeing that some of our chron chronic pain patients are choosing the dangerous alternatives to street drugs, which is whether it's Kratom, heroin or illegal purchasing of prescription drugs. And this only expands that circle of the opioid crisis. Lastly, I wanted to make note of some ongoing observation of the rampant use of methamphetamine by those in our Suboxone program and beyond. And preliminary data for 2017 suggests that in Humboldt County, deaths from methamphetamine rival that of deaths from opioids. And so we know our work has only begun on all aspects of addiction. In closing, we at Open Door are passionate about addressing this crisis and commit to working with all our community partners. Crises like this one with its enormity can cause us to lose sight of the individual and respond with big brush actions and labeling. I encourage each one of us to step back 
get educated, and engage in conversation with compassion, which I believe will lead to lead, evolve this crisis to opportunity with creative action and healing. Thank you. We want to say thank you to Open Door for their commitment to the North Coast and to the health and well-being of thousands. Let's give them a round of applause, please. We now would like to be able to bring up Alex Dodd. He's the CEO of Aegis Treatment Centers. They're going to be opening up later this year uh, here uh, on just outside of Eureka. And we welcome the CEO to our town hall meeting. Let's give him a round of applause. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I've been in the field for only six years, uh, but have the responsibility and honor to look after um, ultimately the health of 10,000 patients who we treat in our 32 clinics in 15 counties. And those patients come from 51 of the 58 counties in our state. And um, I've worked with doctors every day, both our own doctors and physician extenders and so forth, and county doctors. But every time, it seems that every time I hear a doctor speak, I learn something. So thank you very much, Julia. It's, for me personally, it's very inspiring to hear the actual medical profession you deal on the front line with this um, every day. Um, I think at the, before I talk about the grant and the clinic, I do want to clear up one misconception um, that has uh, come out in a, inadvertently, if you like. Um, and that is that the Aegis is the administra administrator or conduit for the grant funding. This $4.8 million of federal funding, which came through the Department of Healthcare Services, um, is coming through us to the community. It is not being given to us to do what we want with it. The $4.8 million is not being given to Aegis to open a clinic, period. We do not see $1 of that money ourselves. It goes through us to the community. We're subject to what is called a single audit because of the federal nature of the funds, and they have to, to keep us honest on that. But I just wanted to, to clear that up. That's a very, very important point. And I know that was actually in Stuart's op-ed that appeared in the Lost Post yesterday. Um, and he and I actually, he met some of our colleagues yesterday, and he and I spoke earlier. And kind of, I think we're all, we're all good, as they say. OK, um, the grant, the grant. Let's talk about the grant, this $4.8 million. The grant is really um, designed to do a few things. Um, the first thing it's designed to do is to extend addiction treatment into primary care. If you think about it, um, it's good, we believe, to have clinics as a centers of excellence for treating patients. But if you've got a patient who needs addiction treatment and they live a long way away, it's pretty useless, whether that is uh, a patient who lives in Reading and had to drive 75 miles every day to Chico or um, lives further afield. So this, the grant money is being used to create a hub and spoke system, uh, which was proven to be very successful in Vermont, which was crippled by the opioid epidemic, um, to really extend, expand and extend medication-assisted treatment into more rural areas. Um, so that's why we're working and partnering with local communities to get that money to them. And I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. The grant funding is also used to help people pay for treatment. Many people are covered by Medi-Cal. Some are fortunate enough to be able to pay for treatment themselves or their families pay for it. And some are covered by private insurance. But many people in our community, community are either underinsured or uninsured. And the grant money is able to help directly pay for patients' treatment. And that's already going on in 18 grant recipients up and down the state. Um, the third thing the grant funding is used for is to expand awareness and community effort of uh, opioid coalitions. Um, obviously, up here, we've got Humboldt Safe Rx, the Del Norte Commission, and increasingly the Hooper Commission. Uh, and just to give an example of that, this afternoon, we ordered it sounds small, but it's, it all helps. 60 Narcan overdose prevention kits for reversal kits, I should say, 
for um, the Hooper Coalition, and I think it's 96 for the Humboldt Sheriff's Department. I think they come in multiples of 12, which is why it's, it's 60 and, and, and 96. Um, okay, let's talk a bit about the clinic, because I know the, the, the clock is running, and the clinic is a very... About three minutes. Uh, three minutes. The clinic is a very controversial subject, whichever county uh, we're, we're in. Um, so I'm going to quick see if this machine work enables me. It does. Um, I want to talk, as far as the clinic, so the clinic that we've found the location, which is the former Eureka Pediatrics building at 2800 Harris. Um, the, the clinic has two pieces to it. Um, on the right-hand side is the piece that we'll actually use as the clinic. And on the left-hand side, you can see a little bit raised, is what Dr. Cody has just finished off using as a billing office. We don't need that part of the building, but it comes with the lease. So that one we're going to make available to the community and patients as a resource. If a patient needs to have a meeting with someone and talk about housing or needs um, some help in finding uh, work, you know, that, that part will be available to the community. Um, one important thing is, is how the treatment works. The medical treatment that we use is the same medical protocol as Open Door that Julie's just described, medication-assisted treatment. I think we, we differ slightly from the open door approach in a few ways. One is that um, we are very uh, intense on the counseling side, both individual counseling and group counseling. For anyone who's had a family member go through rehab, it's all about, we think, giving the patient the skills and confidence to lead a drug-free life. I used to be a smoker. It took me seven, year, seven attempts and two years to stop smoking. Why? Because initially I thought, I could just stop smoking. I'm smart, I can do that. I couldn't do it. I had to learn the skills about how to be a non-smoker. And it's exactly the same, but more difficult if you're trying to give up, let's say, heroin. The other half of the treatment really is the medication that Julie referred to. Our programs use all three federally approved medications, Suboxone, Vivitrol, and Methadone. The reason we do that is that's the way we're licensed and also, we believe it gives the patient and the doctor a wider choice of finding the best medication for the individual. If you had an infection, you wouldn't want to just have a single antibiotic that you could try and use. If, you, if, the, if one antibiotic didn't work for you, you wouldn't want not to be able to get, to get treatment. Um, and our program is also very structured. Uh, I think it was actually Bill Hunter, who was here last time, who acknowledged that you know, some of the patients that Open Door sees or anyone else sees, they would do better in a more structured environment in which they're much more, they're, they're more accountable. Okay, what will the clinic look like? Um, as I, we were in a meeting earlier today and someone said, look, you know, this isn't, the, this isn't your mama's methadone clinic from the 90s. Um, the face of addiction has changed. Um, everybody knows a heroin addict. Sometimes you just don't know who they are. People who are addicted to opioids these days, as we all know, but you've got to say it all the time, are our friends, our family, and our co-workers. One minute. Um, so a, modern, a clinic has got to look and feel and, and, and be the real, the real thing. This is, uh, we opened a clinic in Reading um, in April of last year. April's our lucky month. In April of last year, that's the lobby. It's a modern healthcare facility. It's got to look warm and inviting. Um, there's a, a community room. And then I just want to show a few pictures to end with of our clinic in Ventura County. Down south, different part of the state. This is uh, Telegraph Road, and the yellow building is uh, the Mavericks Gym. And then you can just see to it, next to it is, uh, is our clinic, um, a, former, a former medical office. That's it from the outside. That's the lobby in the front office. Some medical staff, doctor's office and exam room. Uh, and a counseling office, medication, and then patient resources. It's a modern healthcare facility that anyone would be proud to help their own family get treated in. In closing, literally the last closing remarks, we believe the clinic will be part of the solution up here. It'll save lives. It'll improve the lives of many people. It'll help with the needle problem. Uh, and, it, and it will not shame the community or anyone who who has to use it. Thank you.
So uh, one of the items I was just mentioning to Mr. Dodd and what he has mentioned is that uh, there will be an opportunity for folks who want to be able to go see the Reading site uh, to be able to get on a bus and head on over. Um, so there, that will be organized here in the upcoming couple of months so that folks can see firsthand uh, the footprint and the services that they offer. Thank you so much, Mr. Dodd, and grateful that you're here tonight. We're now uh, grateful that Dr. Bayan is here. She's the medical, dir medical director for Waterfront Recovery Center. Uh, doctor, you want to do it from your seat, or would you like to come up here? Come on up. Yeah. Um, let's give it. <laughs> Dr. Ruby uh, travels with her fan club, uh, which is fantastic. <laughs> Uh, but we are uh, so grateful for her hard work and to the work of Waterfront Recovery Center. Let's give her a round of applause. We paid you all. <laughs> My name is Ruby Bayan. I'm an uh, addiction psychiatrist and the medical director. And, and a me the medical director for Waterfront. Um, John McManus and I, this was our dream, which we worked on for more than three years. And finally, uh, with the help of the seed, seed money from St. Joseph and uh, uh, from partnership, we were able to open a partnership between alcohol uh, care, drug care services and RCAA. It's a 56-bed medically managed residential treatment with 20 beds of medically managed detox for alcohol, opiate, uh, meth, and a combination of all. Um, the uh, program was designed to provide the highest uh, evidence-based uh, uh, SUD treatment for the high acuity patients in our area to divert clients from local emergency rooms, to divert some from sempervirans, and to pursue drug medical certification. Since we opened in November 2017, 73% of our total admissions were homeless. We have admitted 219 residents, 161 to detox, and 66 directly to residential. Uh, our current graduation rate for residential is 68%. We at the WRS have been working re uh, relentlessly to refine our clinical program to better meet the needs of the most at need in our community, and we are very proud of our results. We have great SUD counselors and great uh, uh, staff. We are able to take care of dual diagnosis clients. And that means mental health, and sometimes we have to deal with their medical problems, such as diabetes, hypertension, and skin infections. We have case management to help access agencies to help our folks be able to uh, when they leave, to be able to have access to housing, transportation, and treatment. WRS operates as a fee service program, and one funding stream is voter-approved Measure Z, which is integral to supporting the health and well-being of our community. The demand for services greatly outpaced when we opened, and the funds that were allocated for fiscal year 2017 to 2018 uh, was un unanticipated. However, I need to clarify some community misconceptions. We never closed our door for even a day. We never kicked out anyone out to the streets. People, our residents who were in residential were transferred to transitional living with available case management for six months. And for those in detox, they were kept at detox until the treatment was completed and referred to the same services 
to transitional living, again, with six months of case management. We have applied for and was granted more Measure Z funding and will be bringing in more Measure Z patients soon. We have submitted our drug medical certification application to the California Dep Department of Health Care Services and we anticipate nine months to a year for certification to be achieved. We are also reaching out to contracting with private insurance companies to broaden, to broaden our payer mix and provide financial stability to the program. I would hate to refer our, our private uh, insurance uh, folks uh, outside of Humboldt or how outside of the state when we have a program as good if not better than those programs outside of us. We work with Open Door, Mental Health, and soon with the AGS Buffenoffrin Program. Uh, however, we have some bucket list wishes. You have about two minutes, Doctor. We worry about our outpatient services and hopefully we're able to provide outpa intensive outpatient for, uh, for our clients and at the same, especially for those who are working, who can come to the outpatient program in the afternoon or in the evening to continue their treatment. The other uh, wish that I personally have as a child psychiatrist, we hope that we're gonna have, we're able to have an intensive outpatient program for adolescents because that seemed to be a, a, a program that's lacking in our community currently. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. And that's uh, ensuring that those who need Medi-Cal are served with treatment uh, is so important and uh, grateful to the work that the doctor has been putting into that. And that's an issue that we've also addressed with the Department of Healthcare Services, uh, is that is an important population that we need to be able to serve here in Humboldt County and throughout the North Coast. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do a quick transition when it comes to our panelists. We want to say thank you to uh, Julie, to Alex, and to Ruby uh, for uh, their work and being on this panel. We're going to adjourn this first panel. We're going to bring up our next panel, and uh, that's going to be Dr. Karen Mark, um, from, who is with the Office of AIDS and the Center for Infectious Disease Control of the California Department of Public Health. Uh, we're going to invite uh, Taylor to please come forward and be able to change the name tags as well. We're going to invite our next panel to please come forward. Uh, we also have Sarah Kerr, Chair and Founding Board Member of the Humboldt Area Center for Harm Reduction. We have Chief Steve Watson from the Eureka Police Department, as well as Connie Beck from the Department of Health and Human Services. Each of these four individuals are going to be speaking about harm reduction and prevalence reduction, particularly the issue of syringes uh, and uh, on the street and needle exchange and disposal. Now, we're going to invite all of our panelists who uh, must be enjoying one of those wonderful cookies uh, in the back. We're going to need each of our panelists to please come forward. All right. But first, ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to be able to have uh, Dr. Karen Mark. Dr. Karen Mark has been, uh, was appointed to the chief, as the chief of the Office of AIDS in the Center for Infectious Diseases with the California Department of Public Health in June of 2003. She's beaming uh, from the great city of Sacramento here this evening. Uh, she'll be discussing needle exchange and disease control measures across the state. She's going to be talking about some model programs that we've seen across California as well as the nation and challenges faced by some local governments. Once the doctor has completed her remarks, we're then going to open it up to all of you to be able to ask any and every question of the doctor. She is then going to have to be able to excuse herself as she has another meeting, and then we'll be putting on our next panelist via Skype. So without further ado, let's give a warm, humble welcome to Dr. Karen Mark. Good evening, and many thanks to Senator McGuire and Supervisor Bass for the invita invitation to speak tonight 
about harm reduction and the important role that it plays in Harm reduction is a public health approach while they're continuing to use services until people are interested in that interest. So what we're going to do is that we're going to come back to the doctor and try to work her audio. Uh, so uh, we have our uh, good folks from Senate Services. If we could put the slate back up, let's work with uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Mark to be able to work on that audio. There we go. Dr. Mark, you are not on the screen anymore. So uh, Dr. Mark has started to cuss. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, but we're going to be hearing from her in just a bit, and uh, our, the good folks from Senate Services will be calling uh, Dr. Mark to be able to get uh, her feed fixed, and we appreciate your patience. In the meantime, uh, we're going to be inviting Sarah Kerr, who is the chair and founding board member of the Humboldt Area Center for Harm Reduction, to be able to kick us off. Um, look, uh, this was an issue that many brought forward uh, at our last town hall, wanting to know what is going to be happening in regard to syringe litter pickup, as well as a enhanced control over syringe distribution in the community. Many of you would ask for Hatcher to be able to please attend. And we are grateful that Sarah Kerr is here tonight. Sarah, why don't you come forward to be able to give your status report on harm reduction, syringe and needle exchange and disposal. Let's give a warm welcome to Sarah Kerr. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah Kerr. I am a founding board member and current chair of the board of Humboldt Area Center for Harm Reduction. Um, first, I just want to say that it's really an honor and a privilege to be here tonight representing Hatcher and engaging in this collaborative conversation, um, focusing on solutions with the community. So thank you for having me. Um, just quickly, a little bit about who Hatcher is. Um, we are a nonprofit that was uh, formed, originally formed in 2014, and we got our uh, incorporated as a 501c nonprofit in June of 2015. Um, we started as a volunteer run organization, but we have grown, and we now have two staff an executive director and a syringe exchange program coordinator, as well as two volunteer stipend roles a community cleanup coordinator and an outreach coordinator and a student stipend role, which is a volunteer coordinator. Um, we have many, many, many volunteers that help us run our operations. Um, harm reduction is at the heart and soul of Hatcher. Uh, we are committed to building stronger, healthier communities by co-creating spaces that foster dignity, equity, and choice. Um, and we strive to fulfill that mission by applying harm reduction in all the services that we offer. So I wanted to take just a second to share a little bit about the services that we offer. Um, and then we'll get to a, a short discussion about syringe distribution and litter. Um, Hatcher does overdose prevention education and naloxone distribution. We distribute, um, we're the biggest distributor of naloxone in the county. Uh, we offer trainings, not only for the clients that visit us and access our services, but also for community groups that request training on a variety of topics from overdose prevention to information about substances um, to safe disposal, safer use. Uh, <clears throat> we collaborate with a lot of different partners to expand our services. For example, we work with Open Door Community Health Centers to provide case management on site weekly. Uh, our case managers that visit us are able to help our clients with a variety of needs, be it from helping them obtain a driver's license to working through maybe social security issues uh, to accessing housing. So we're really grateful to them for that. Um, we work with our clients and provide lots of referrals to services in the community, uh, addiction services, tr addiction treatment, hepatitis C treatment, mental health services, uh, primary care, and then a whole host of social services as well. Uh, we have a clothes closet where people can come and access uh, clean and gently used clothing. Uh, we do food resources, so we have sk skill building for our peers that come and want to lead uh, in food prep, food handling. Uh, we serve about 30 people a day uh, lunch. Uh, we also work with uh, Synapsis to do an art collaborative where people can come and uh, do art, and through that art, uh, work on communication and connection. 
So let's talk about syringe exchange. Um, we do offer syringe exchange services 10 hours a week out of our location. Uh, when Hatcher began syringe exchange services, we applied the methods recommended as best practice by the California Department of Public Health. That's a needs-based model. In a needs-based model, clients are given the number of syringes needed to use a sterile, sterile syringe with every use. However, over the past six to eight months, eight, six to eight months, in response to the syringe litter issue, Hatcher has modified our syringe distribution <clears throat> to be much more conservative. And while we recognize needs-based as the ideal form of syringe exchange, uh, we are also dedicated to being partners in the community effort to mitigate syringe litter while still providing excellent harm reduction services to our clients. So currently, uh, all clients are started on a one-to-one -one exchange. And as we build trust and rapport with someone and they're able to demonstrate ongoing proper disposal of syringes, then we're able to move closer to a needs-based model with them. Um, regarding disposal, uh, disposal is a huge part of syringe exchange. Uh, Hatcher did over 10,000 pounds of syringe uh, and hazardous waste disposal last year. Um, we contract with Eco Medical for hazardous waste disposal. They come to our office once a week. They weigh our, our hazardous waste and they take it off to dispose of it property, properly. Uh, we have wall-mounted mini kiosk outside our, of our office for the hours that we are closed if people need to uh, safely dispose of a syringe. Um, and we also distribute sharps containers of a variety of sizes to meet the different needs of our clients to be able to uh, properly dispose of their syringes wherever they may be, whether they can get back to us or not. They have a safe container to keep them in. Um, I mentioned before that we have a peer stipend for community cleanup coordinator. And this person, um, we adopted our block that we're on and he leads up bo uh, block cleanup every day. Um, and in addition to that, he goes out four times a week on foot patrol, looking specifically for syringe litter um, in our neighborhood and the greater Old Town Eureka area. Um, and then also uh, in regards to syringe disposal, Hatcher has been participating in a syringe disposal coalition which is a group of community service providers and oversight agencies working together to tackle the problem. That group includes uh, Eureka Police Department, City of Eureka, DHHS, Open Door, Parks and Rec, Waste Management, us. I'm sure I missed some people. Um, but we're really grateful to be at the table and be part of the solution. Well, perfect, because I think I'm done. I just want to thank everybody. <laughs> I thank everybody for, um, for having us here today. Um, and again, we really look forward to being part of the solution and collaborating with you um, and continuing the conversation. So thank you. Nice job. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you for uh, jumping in with our technical difficulty as well. So uh, going a little early. So we are working on the audio with Dr. Mark. So here's what we'd like to be able to propose. Uh, we're going to go through the remaining members of our panel. Next up is going to be the chief of police from the Eureka Police Department, Steve Watson. We'll then hear from Connie Beck, who is the director of the Department of Health and Human Services. And then we're going to be bringing back uh, Dr. Mark there from Sacramento as we're working through our technical difficulties. So ladies and gentlemen, and without further ado, to be able to give us an update about what the city of Eureka has been focusing on since November and how Chief Watson and the entire police department has been focused on this issue, let's give a welcome to uh, Mr. Steve Watson. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you again for coming out tonight to uh, discuss this very important issue in all of our minds with us tonight. Um, much of what I have to talk about for the next few minutes has already been touched upon by other speakers, uh, but I'll kind of, kind of run you through it. Um, for the last two to three years, we've seen a dramatic increase in the amount of needle litter and uh, opioid use in the city of Eureka. Um, that really came to the forefront as the problem became more dispersed as we vacated the Palco Marsh back in, in May of 2016. Um, and it really came to a head this past summer, as many of you know, as um, people really began to just notice this needle litter everywhere, literally throughout the city, um, on doorsteps, in your backyards, on businesses, in our parks, and along our trails. And so we recognized that we needed to identify uh, the source of the issue, 
as well as begin to collaborate with community stakeholders on addressing the issue in, in the city of Eureka. And so to that aim, the city of Eureka and the Eureka Police Department reached out uh, in partnership with the Department of Health and Human Services and Con Director Connie Beck, uh, and the first stakeholder meeting was called together, I believe it was in October, and it involved, as you've heard tonight, uh, many different groups that have uh, something to do or can contribute to addressing this issue. And again, that included the city, the police department, the Department of Health and Human Services and Public Health, uh, Hatcher, um, St. Joe's and Mobile Medical, uh, Open Door, I believe, and, I'm, and again, I'm probably missing a few people. Uh, Humboldt Waste Management even came to the table because obviously they're a key ally in the collection and safe disposal of syringes. And so we sat at the table. Um, I have to admit that I came in with some preconceived beliefs. I still hold some of them, uh, but others. Um, I began to, uh, I was educated through the process, I'll put it that way. And I realized it's not just as simple as pointing the finger at just the strange exchange programs for this, this issue, even though um, obviously the more needles you put out into the community, there's some math involved, you're gonna see potentially more litter. Um, you know, it was really, it's been a productive process. Uh, we realized we need a multi-pronged approach to address this issue. Uh, the underlying issues of the opioid epidemic sweeping our nation, uh, it's not something we have the ability to solve overnight. Uh, that's gonna take a lot of work, a lot of effort, and a lot of resources. So we focus on what we can do something about, what we have control over. And so that multi-pronged approach includes not only education uh, for those that, are, that have substance abuse disorders and are using uh, to the community that maybe um, is suffering from this issue as well and uh, having to clean up the mess, so to speak, uh, and so educating the public on these issues and also safe collection. Uh, we also looked at making it easier to dispose of needles safely as one important um, you know, area that really needed to be addressed. And so to that end, a few things took place. Um, the County of Humboldt, uh, you'll hear more about that, opened up some kiosks. The city considered the same thing and we decided to go a little bit different route. What we did was created some uh, collection points or syringe disposal locations in the city of Eureka. Five of them currently, the Eureka Police Department, Humboldt Bay, Fire Station One, across from Denny's, um, the Warfringer Building, the Adorney Center, and then City Hall or Public Works. You can also dispose of needles in the city of Eureka down at Humboldt Waste Management Authority, and they have four other locations throughout the county where you can do so. So if you come to one of these locations, uh, you need to bring your needles um, in uh, a Sharps container. We will give you Sharps containers at any of these locations, as well as instructions on how to safely dispose of and collect the needles. So you'll get a pamphlet uh, that looks something like this. If I can get the paper clip off. So it gives you the disposal locations, and then it'll give you how to safely collect and store um, Sharps, and which is, again, an important part of community education because uh, we don't want anyone to get in it inadvertently injured. Um, I've talked about the stakeholder group. I've talked about what the city is doing. We did do one other thing. Uh, we created an ordinance. You heard a little bit about that tonight. I'll just briefly touch upon a few of the key points of the new ordinance. The second reading was on March 20th. Uh, council approved it with one additional change. Um, basically, uh, syringe exchange providers have to report to the city manager on a quarterly basis, statistics that include but don't have to be limited to the following. The number of needles distributed, the number of needles returned or collected, the location of the return collected needles, the number of referrals made for other services, and the number of law enforcement incidences related to the syringe exchange program. Also, uh, SEPs must demonstrate a plan and implementation for injection drug users to seek treatment for substance abuse and provide referral for substance abuse treatment and other prevention healthcare services uh, to participants in the program. Also, SEPs are required to organize and participate in cleanups of used needles on a weekly basis and to report the results of those efforts quarterly. Uh, ID cards for SEP employees and volunteer workers are required. Um, SEPs can't operate within 1,000 feet of an elementary and or secondary school, um, meeting all the requirements and goes into some issues of what defines those schools. And I believe we added parks to that uh, on March 20th. 
Also, SEPs are required to ensure that SHARPs are disposed of at the organizational level in conformance with OSHA standards. So we gotta do it the, the right way. They have to do it the right way. And then finally, SEPs shall implement and maintain syringe collection and disposal procedures that encourage program participants to return used syringes to the program and or to dispose of them properly. So again, reducing the litter and collect SHARPs waste in such a way to minimize direct handling by program staff, volunteers, and clients. So some of the key, key highlights are there. Okay, one minute. Um, I, I'll just add one other, one other thing. Um, you know, anecdotally, I've asked our problem-oriented policing sergeant who's out there almost every day um, in the green belts in our parks, if, are they seeing any difference yet? Um, he did tell us at our last stakeholder meeting that they're starting to see fewer needles. Uh, there are certain individuals that wherever they go, it's the same old, same old, but starting to see a reduction. Um, I did talk to a new officer that uh, has 12 years in law enforcement in Mendocino and Humboldt County. He left for nine months and came back to us a couple months ago, having last worked for Arcata PD. And uh, you know, it was kind of a shock for him how many needles he saw in Eureka. Uh, but he doesn't really have the baseline yet of looking where we were nine months ago or six months ago when we started this and where we're at today. So I hope we're making an incremental step in the right direction and starting to make some progress. We're definitely not there yet. Um, but these are all important steps to that process. Um, and again, I want to thank you all for coming tonight, for being part of this important process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief. We are now grateful to be able to bring up the Director of the Department of Health and Human Services for the County of Humboldt. Her name is Connie Beck. She's going to be giving an overview about the progress we've seen from the County of Humboldt uh, in every corner, and then also taking a bit of a deeper dive on the issue of syringe and needle exchange on behalf of the county as well. Let's give a welcome to Ms. Connie Beck. Thank you, Senator McGuire. Um, like you said, I'm Connie Beck. I'm the Director of Health and Human Services. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. I see a bunch of um, partners, and I so appreciate you all being here um, to be a part of this important topic. Um, I'll give an update first on syringe litter. Since our meeting in November, DHHS has installed two syringe disposal kiosks in high-use areas, the first at our social services campus on Coster Street and the second at Public Health Main, located at 529 I Street in Eureka. Pickups have occurred in January and February with a total of 122 pounds of syringes collected, including an emergency pickup at the I Street location because the kiosk was full. Because pickup takes place at the end of the month, we don't yet have all of the March's numbers. Um, there are 250 sharps per pound. So if you do the math, that's 30,500 sharps um, since January. A third kiosk is being installed at the Clark Complex near the adult mental health branch. These kiosks are in addition to the sites noted by Chief Watson. So that's where we are with syringes. In terms of opioids, the news is not so good. Since the last town hall, we've begun finalizing our substance abuse mortality report for 2017. And while it shows no increase in drug deaths, it shows no decrease either in 2017. 45 people died from their addictions, eight of those from prescription opioids, two from heroin, 16 from meth, and the others from a mix of drugs and alcohol. That's down only one death from 2016. In addition to the, measure S, uh, the measures Supervisor Bass has already mentioned, DHHS is working to impact these numbers by increasing the number of staff on the streets and engaging with homeless subset of this population, which has become more difficult and expensive to reach since homeless people were dispersed throughout the city in May of 2016. We're also working with the state to increase treatment op options for people on Medi-Cal, Additionally, we're working to develop a transition to work program for clients who are not eligible for other work programs. The long-term intent is to set up a social enterprise center where people can earn money while developing job skills. 
You'll hear much more about these initiatives as they move forward. I will be talking with service clubs and other partners in the future. Also, the Humboldt County Office of Education is hiring a licensed clinical social worker to provide direct resource services, direct resource services to children and families dealing with truancy. Health and Human Services is paying half the cost with the Office of Education picking up the other half. We're hoping that this will have a positive impact on school attendance and achievement. Oh, this will uh, begin on July 1st. As noted from the previous speakers, we continue to meet with all of our partners and just know that we are listening to all of you um, and we'll continue to act on the concerns of the community. Thank you all for being here. So ladies and gentlemen, our goal for tonight and what our goal was in November and what our goal will be in the future is to bring all of the local and statewide experts together to provide you with the latest information on this crisis that has impacted big cities and small across this state. To do that, we are hoping that the technology gods are gonna allow us to be able to bring in Dr. Karen Mark. Uh, so uh, here's the deal. Uh, we have the hamster behind the scenes that uh, has been working the wheel uh, and spit out the bubble gum and I think we got it fixed. So. Ladies and gentlemen, one more time, let's welcome from the great city of Sacramento, the Chief of the Office of AIDS, Dr. Karen Mark. Thank you very much, and I hope that things are working better now. Um, so once again, good evening, and thanks so much to Senator McGuire and Supervisor Bass for the invitation to speak about harm reduction and the important role that it plays in the prevention of HIV, hepatitis C, and other infectious diseases. Harm reduction is a public health approach to working with people who use drugs while they're continuing to use, rather than waiting to offer health and social services until people are interested in stopping their drug use. It's about engaging people early and building trust, and it often builds a bridge to substance abuse disorder treatment much earlier than other types of approaches. Over two decades of research have demonstrated that engaging early with people who use drugs to reduce harm has significant public health impacts. Although most often associated with syringe exchange programs or syringe services programs, most harm reduction programs provide a wide variety of services, including overdose prevention, HIV and hepatitis C testing and linkage to care and treatment, linkage to substance abuse disorder treatment and health care, and assistance with accessing health benefits such as Medi-Cal. Syringe services programs became widespread in the United States with the advent of the HIV epidemic in the 1980s. Since then, over 200 peer-reviewed studies have found that syringe services programs reduce HIV and viral hepatitis transmission substantially. In New York, the State Department of Health credits SSPs with reducing HIV prevalence among people who inject drugs from 50% in 1990 to less than 3% today, which is really amazing. SSPs reduce the risk of related diseases such as abscesses or cellulitis, skin infections, and endocarditis, or infections of the heart valves. By improving hygiene and safety, SSPs reduce bacterial disease, which can be debilitating or deadly and expensive to treat. SSPs improve people's access to substance abuse disorder treatment, and SSPs do not increase drug use or attract people who inject drugs to a particular area. There is a consensus in the medical, scientific, and public health communities that these programs work. Over the past few decades, hundreds of medical and public health organizations have endorsed them, including the CDC, the American Medical Association, the Society for Addiction Medicine, and the American Academy of Pediatrics, just to name a few. California currently has 42 authorized SSPs, many of which have been in operation since the early 1990s. They are a critically important part of statewide efforts to end the HIV epidemic and improve the health and well-being of all Californians. Despite the effectiveness of SSPs, we've still seen recent outbreaks of HIV and hepatitis C where SSPs haven't existed or had insufficient reach. Most notably is Scott County, Indiana, a small, small rural community 
where over a five-month period in 2016, more than 180 people were rapidly infected with HIV and hepatitis C through injection drug use and sharing injection equipment. When then-Governor Mike Pence authorized SSPs as a result of this outbreak, people rapidly took advantage of the new services. Syringe sharing decreased by 70%, and the proportion of people safely disposing of syringes increased from 18% to 82%. Despite the fact that California does have SSPs, one of the alarming results of the opioid crisis has been an increase in injection drug use in the state, especially among young people. CDC has determined that California is at risk for an increase in viral hepatitis or HIV infections due to injection drug use and supports the need for SSPs. Why is this important for Humboldt? Between 2011 and 2015, Humboldt saw a 49% increase in hepatitis C cases. The largest increase was among men in their 20s, which the CDPH Office of Viral Hepatitis Prevention presumes to be largely a result of recent infections due to injection drug use. Among both women and men, there were large increases in both the 20 to 29-year-old and the 30 to 39-year-old age groups. Humboldt's rate of new hepatitis C cases in 2015 was nearly three times higher than the state average. Recent outbreaks of HIV in Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, and Massachusetts were all preceded by increases in rates of hepatitis C virus infection. For 2015, Humboldt had lower rates of new HIV cases and people living with HIV than California as a whole, but Humboldt's rate of new HIV diagnoses increased by 78% from 2011 to 2015, while statewide the rate decreased by 6%. Humboldt has doing, been doing a lot right to address these issues, and you've heard much about that today and, and, and we'll be he hearing more. Um, so what can we at the California Department of Public Health Office of AIDS offer? Um, in addition to um, funding uh, a PrEP navigation program uh, it's in the Humboldt County Department of Health, we also provide funds for HIV care and HIV surveillance in the county. And statewide, uh, we operate a syringe ex exchange supply clearinghouse, which provides a baseline level of supplies to syringe services programs and pays for syringe disposal for community-based organizations. The Office of AIDS staff also provide technical assistance and have been collaborating with the Humboldt County Department of Health and Human Services in recent months on matters related to safe syringe disposal, program policies and oversight and related issues. So I want to really thank all of you for giving me the opportunity to share with you uh, the data supporting um, harm reduction programs and um, really open it up to any questions that people may have. Thank you. Thank you so much. If we can give a round of applause to Dr. Karen Mark. So uh, the way we uh, have worked this um, is that we had to turn off our volume over in her shop. So we're going to have uh, Dr. Mark hold for one moment. Uh, we are then going to bring up our final panelists. So if we could put the slate back up real quick. Uh, and I want to say thank you to Dana and the entire media services team who have been uh, doing such a great job. We're putting the slate back up, right, Dana? All right, there we go. We will get that up shortly. So the doctor is still, there we go, hot dang. Uh, we have to watch out because the doctor again starts cussing. So uh, I'm kidding. Um, the final panel that we have uh, for you this evening is on the issue of sober living environments. So the issue of sober living environments came forward uh, at our last town hall. And there was some serious concern about uh, some specific homes in the city of Eureka that uh, we heard from the audience had, uh, and I'll use the terms that were used last time, out of control drug use and some prostitution. Uh, and what we wanted to be able to bring forward is have a conversation about sober living homes. What I will share with you is that there is not an easy resolution to regulating sober living homes. But we do have the statewide expert on sober living homes with us here tonight. His name is Pete Nielsen. He's the ex executive director of the California Consortium of Addiction Programs and Professionals. He is gonna be discussing, and look at this, uh, he's there. Um, the way, uh, what he's gonna do is he is going to cover 
all issues about what can be done on a voluntary effort. And then there are some counties in this state that advance a set of standards that homes have to abide by. Again, there will be some challenges because of federal law, but we're gonna turn it over to Mr. Pete Nielsen, the Executive Director of the California Consortium of Addiction Programs and Professionals. Let's give him a round of applause. He'll be talking about sober living homes. Thank you, Senator Meyer and uh, Supervisor Bass for having me speak, and good evening, everybody. So I'm happy to talk to you about uh, sober living, um, also known as recovery residency. So what is sober living? Well, it's a group of individuals that make the decision to decide to live together for one common goal, for, the, for them to stay sober and help encourage each other on their road to recovery. Um, where did recovery residents come from? Where did this idea of sober living come from? Well, you know, there was uh, treatment facilities um, many years ago that had 30 days, 60 days of treatment, and then their funding would run, run out, and where would the individuals go after their funding? They couldn't go back home, they needed a safe place to live, and uh, a place where other people that are uh, trying to achieve the same goal um, could support them. And so, you know, that really is where and why sober living um, exists, uh, is, is to provide that peer support for individuals to be able to recover from the disease of, of addiction. And so one of the main issues and uh, points of confusion is what is the difference between residential treatment um, or rehab and sober living? Um, residential treatment has clinical services. They have professionals on staff that uh, treat the individuals uh, for the disease of addiction. Recovery residents typically have, sometimes they have house managers or staff, or they may have, um, you know, group leaders that live at the, the home, but uh, they have no authority except for what the other residents give them, you know, inside the house. So. There's many different types of sober living. Uh, if you look at the National Alliance for Recovery Residents, they have four different levels. Uh, level one and level two are the ones that mainly you would see in California. Uh, level three and level four uh, in California are really licensed residential, um, so they don't really apply, but level one and level two are the type of residences. Level one is a recovery residence where the peers um, run the house, the peers control the house, the peers are the ones that ha have either, either the lease or um, they're the ones that uh, work together to have this uh, co-op uh, living, but there's um, no real entity that's in charge. Uh, then you have level twos where you have a house manager and you may have another entity that may be in control of that home, and that may be a treatment um, provider who also provides sober living. Many county contracts also have sober living as a uh, part of the, the continuum of care. And, you know, thanks to the organized delivery system, we're seeing a lot more um, uh, housing related to individuals that need that supportive environment after they leave treatment. Uh, it's many times too difficult for individuals to find a place to live that is conducive to their recovery, and sometimes they may, may need to live there for, um, you know, a month, two months, and some of them live there for um, a year or more. So it depends on what the individual needs. Also, um, in, with recovery residents, they do not have any uh, structure from uh, the state that governs them. Uh, a licensed residential has a Department of Health Care Services that oversees them. Uh, sober living or recovery residence does not. And so then the big question is, why not? Why isn't there any oversight? And some people say that there should be oversight. We agree that it, there needs to be oversight. The problem is that um, there is the Fair Housing Act as well as Americans with Disability, that uh, both of those um, make it difficult to, to offer oversight. Not impossible, 
Um, so then, well, let's amend the Fair Housing or, you know, get rid of the Americans disability that uh, gets in the way of, of regulating these homes. To do that then would put individuals who suffer from the disease of addiction in harm's way because then uh, you would have city ordinances or county ordinances that would, um, they may uh, uh, not want sober living or recovered residences inside that uh, neighborhood and then you would relegate um, individuals that are in recovery to the fringes of the community and maybe outside of the community, which then might not be conducive for their recovery. So um, the biggest thing that, that we see that, that when uh, individuals um, or neighbors have complaints is uh, the music's too loud or there's individuals smoking in front of the home, um, there's too many cars, um, all of those are definitely valid complaints. And so um, good uh, uh, sober living homes or recovery residences um, would not have, um, you know, uh, excess cars, um, you know, smoking in front of the, the home. They would, they would be good neighbors. And part of uh, what's important about recovery residences is there is uh, governance over them. Um, it's voluntary at this point. Um, and they would be certified by a organization um, such as ourselves that would that follow national standards. Uh, those national standards are from NAR, National uh, Alliance for Recovery Residences. So with that, those different, um, uh, the, uh, the difference, uh, what a good uh, uh, recovery residence would uh, then follow as far as those national standards, which they would have a good neighbor's policy in place. They would have um, um, also, they would have um, Pete, you're not only a good neighbor policy, but they time. would also have health and safety. They also would have a recovery environment. And so when we inspect homes, we actually go out and we not only talk to the house manager or the owner, we also talk to the residents themselves. We look and see, is this a safe environment? Do they have working smoke detectors? Do, um, do they have, you know, uh, appropriate exits? You know, what is the home like? Um, do they have, uh, are, is it a, uh, are they uh, looking at how they affect the community? Are they a positive um, aspect to the community? So we look at all of this as we inspect the homes. And so um, right now it's a voluntary certification um, and it's it's uh, something that uh, we're looking to to not only um, expand that concept. So we would uh, like to see that um, the good actors are rewarded and the bad actors are not rewarded. And so the bad actors are the the uh, individuals or groups that do not have um, recovery environments, that there are people using in the homes, they don't support recovery, uh, they don't have appropriate uh, um, housing, uh, they, they, they stack too many in a home, they don't, uh, uh, you know, cooperate with their neighbors, they, they don't uh, deal with the community. So those homes we would like to minimize or get rid of, and we would like to have those good actors or those good homes. And um, Assembly Bill uh, 2214 would do that. They would, um, they would, you know, uh, have an opportunity to have this um, uh, uh, statewide certification for those homes, and it would promote um, responsible um, sober living or responsible recovery residences. And I think that's really important to look at that there is a solution. And it's something that it, it, it has taken a while to get to this to, to this point. This isn't the first bill that uh, we've tried to uh, move forward in this. So I just appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about uh, the subject and thank you for your time. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Nielsen.
All right, so ladies and gentlemen, we do appreciate your patience. Um, so here's what we'd like to be able to do if it works for all of you. We'd like to be able to open it up for the most important part of this evening, and that is for questions, comments, conversation. Of course, we would like to be able to hear your criticisms as well. We'd like to welcome back our first panel. If we could have Julie, Alex, and Ruby to please join us right uh, behind. We're going to leave the chief. We're going to leave Connie and Sarah just right where you're at. And we welcome to the chair uh, to... Uh, to the video. So here's what we, um, it's going to be a little tricky, as I said, uh, and I want to say thank you to Dana, Brian, Phil, and Doug, as they have been doing some media jujitsu behind the scenes. So the way it's been working is, uh, let's give them a round of applause, please, my goodness. I don't know if you noticed with Mr. Nielsen, but he could not hear us when we were giving him time cues. Um, and uh, so the way it will work is this. Uh, if you have any questions for Dr. Mark or Mr. Nielsen, uh, they have the audio happening right now, so they can hear what we're saying. And the minute they start speaking, they then will uh, have to turn off the audio so they can't hear you any longer. So uh, it's going to be one question and done, and there won't, be, there won't be any back and forth, and we apologize as we've had some technical difficulties. But again, big thank you to Dana, Brian, Phil, and Doug for all the work. Before we get into tonight's um, questions and comments, we also want to say thank you to Chris Hartley, Superintendent Hartley, who has opened up this beautiful facility for us. He's here tonight. Let's give our hardworking superintendent a round of applause. <laughs> superintendent of Humboldt County Schools. And of course, we want to say thank you to Access Humboldt, who's been broadcasting live, as well as our good friends at KMUD as well. We're grateful for all their work. Let's give them a round of applause, please. All right. So without further ado, we are going to head out to, uh, to all of you. And if you have any questions, uh, each of our panelists are prepared to be able to answer uh, anything and everything. And again, we thank you for your patience this evening. Let's kick off the public input portion. and. Uh, Supervisor, why don't you head on out there, and then uh, we'll start splitting up. Just head on out. Go right ahead. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. And you have uh, each individual has two minutes. Okay. Is this on? So my name is Stuart Altschuler, and um, I first want to start this with an apology to Senator McGuire and Supervisor Bass with some of the things that came out in my op-ed today. Um, that jumped to a few conclusions. Um, and I want to say that having had a meeting yesterday with uh, Jordan, Judson, <laughs> and Sarah, and talking with the doctor today here too, um, one of the things that I was really impressed with is the level of professionalism and their commitment to doing something that, with all due respect, I wish you guys had done before you announced the money, educated all of us about what this hub and spoke situation is. Um, because once I started hearing that, it seems like our whole region is going to be covered with clinics and services that we have not had before. And with that being said, um, I also want to make sure that the other services that are needed here that I outlined in that op-ed, in terms of things that were mentioned, like good quality transitional housing, not dumpy places, and, okay, and uh, not just outpatient for adolescents, but we've never had residential treatment for adolescents. Prevention programs that start in elementary school and go all the way through to college. And there are a few others in here, but I really would like, that. I know that's money separate from the opioid thing, but it's all interrelated. And um, I'd also lastly want people who are in College of the Redwoods Addiction Studies program to raise your hands or graduates. Good. And I'm glad they're here. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to go uh, right over here. We're going to go. We had this side of the room. We're going to head over right over here. Thank you so much. Supervisor Bass is going to be going to our next. We do appreciate all the hard work with the CR students who are here tonight. Thank you so much. If you don't mind, just give us your first name. And you have two minutes. And we're grateful that you're here. It's good to see you again. Fire away. 
Hi, my name is Pat. I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for a long time. And thank you, Mike, and thank you, Virginia. And I want to thank the providers and doctors. You're doing wonderful. But uh, <laughs> how are we going to pay for this, guys? Okay, we're going to beg the insurance companies. We're going to say patients only qualify because they have money. Please, use your votes. Get SB 562 single payer in because the insurance companies are just going to charge you more and more and more money. And it's going to make me cry because our patients, people are dying. Because insurance companies don't care about you. They care about the bottom line. So I want to thank all the providers and all the physicians for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. Supervisor, back to you, please. Hi, I'm, G I'm Ginger Olson. I've been a treatment provider for 35 years in Humboldt County, as well as an educator. I don't want to, to judge prior to investigation. I'd like to take the time to see what's going to happen. But I remember when we brought Kingsview in here 30 years ago. We brought them in to, to save us. What they did was to close down my adolescent program they closed down a program for children. They closed down programs for, uh, for the mentally ill, and then they left. I don't want to see that happen now. What I am concerned about is we have a whole community here of treatment providers. You haven't even mentioned Humboldt Recovery or Crossroads, and they've been, And they were here long before any of these others. What I would like to see is bringing all of, the, all of the players together and giving us an opportunity to talk about what we have to offer, what we need, and how you can help us. We need money. Right now, Humble Recovery and Crossroads are not full because nobody is paying for No, thank you so much. Actually, in our at our next town hall, we'll definitely invite uh, others uh, who have been doing the fantastic work here on the ground in Humboldt for many, many years, and we welcome them to be able to participate at our next town hall. As we will have another, uh, as we want to make sure that we are holding all of ourselves accountable on progress that needs to be made. We're going to go to our next speaker. You have two minutes. If you don't mind, just giving us your first name. My name is Hillary. I'm here as an early childhood educator. And we're seeing the children of the opioid addicted mothers coming into our early childhood programs. These kids are at great risk. They're at risk for abuse. They are at risk for learning disabilities. They show attentional difficulties, cognitive difficulties, delays, often five-year-olds acting like an 18-month-old. And we in the early childhood field are not, we don't have the kinds of wraparound services these kids need. We'd like to see a reallocation of some funding, for instance, FIRST Five, to deal specifically with these issues. When I tried to research, there's very little research being done on these children. And these are the very people who will start that cycle again. They're in environments with addicted parents. They're learning those behaviors. It's nature and nurture for these kids. And all the cards are stacked against them. We have to recognize this and offer help for the educators, for the children, and for the parents of these children. To how are you going to raise these kids now, especially if you're also looking at overcoming your addiction? No, thank you so much, Hillary. Thank you. We're going to go to Supervisor Bass for our next question, and we'll come right up here. We welcome you, sir. My name is Philip Bowser, and uh, I'm kind of like more of a devil's advocate for opioids. I was injured in 2001 with a spine injury. I've had five spine operations. Now I have to worry about every four months having my medications denied. Even though I have to transport myself all the way to San Francisco to see a specialty person for, for pain management and because it's workers' comp, like I say, they find out this is the only thing that will help me. It gives me a quality of life. It takes my pain levels down from a five to a two all day so I can at least uh, have some type of family life. But when they decided that with this 
whole opiate crisis to throw the people who are like me, who have chronic pain problems under the bus, it creates a, other, a whole other situation, especially for us who have to advocate for us. Thank you. The great concern, those who are challenged with chronic pain needing to be able to secure the medication. Julie, uh, from Open Door, would you like to be able to answer that? So uh, that's one of the reasons I brought up chronic pain was uh, in your situation, sir. Um, and so we're looking to try to get more educated, certainly, about non-opioid modalities. But we are using buprenorphine now for chronic pain. It was actually created 40 years ago in Europe specifically for chronic pain. It's only in the United States that it was really segmented towards um, uh, substance use disorders. And so I think we all need to do a better job around that. Uh, this is a rapid uh, pendulum that you know, flew hard and fast. And um, so we feel for you, and we're going to keep working at it. Um, but we do are providing some services around that and are open to helping. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, we encourage any questions that you may have, comments to our panel. We also have uh, two of our all-star panelists there on the screen from Sacramento. Let's go to our next speaker. If you don't mind, I'm going to ask each of you to please stand just so we can get you on the live stream uh, as well. If you don't mind, just give us your first name. You have two minutes. My name is Anne Marie, and I'd like to speak to what has worked. And I'd like to say that there's a ton of people right in those two front rows who really care and are passionate. And I didn't agree with everything, and I got kicked out of your program, and I was pissed because you cared about me so goddamn much, and it hurt. And it was because there wasn't enough money. And anyway, I'm an active addict, and I would not be alive if there were two people that are not in this room who hadn't stepped in my life. And I think there may be some others here who might not be here because of their lives, who are now helping others. And one is, I don't even know her last name, but it's Dawn. And she told me, I love first Anne-Marie, and I treat the addiction next. And she ran the detox program, which was a shoestring program, and she had a heart. She has a heart. She's still around. She's just not here in this county anymore. And, but she saved my life. The other person is Mark Lammers, who met me in jail, which I don't think is a solution to addiction, and I don't agree with putting people in jail when they call for a suicide hotline and say, I want to kill myself, and I get put in jail for being under the influence of alcohol. I don't agree with that, and I'm pissed. And I've spent many days in jail, and then I get put in solitary confinement with a drain in the jail and stripped of my clothes and a taser pointed at me because I do have mental illness, and when you put me in jail, I get a little bit pissed. Okay, but Mark Lammers gave me, I met him in jail. He's not here tonight, and I won't say why, but I wish he could be. Because I think he saved, he saved my life, I know that, and my guess is he saved a lot of others. Because Mark Lammers and Don gave me dignity, hope, and respect. And those have to come first. Thank you so much. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Please, we'll go to the councilman. Welcome, councilman, and thank you for all your work, sir. Hi there. Uh, I'm Austin Allison, City Council for Eureka. I just want to thank everyone that's here, all the government officials, community members, et cetera, because it's going to take all of us to get out of this uh, opioid crisis together. But just looking at the national trends, it looks like we might not have even hit our peak yet for opioids, and uh, it's just a really scary, looming thought. Um, just the only thing I wanted to talk about today uh, was just uh, addressing a concern with the Aegis Treatment Center on Harris Street. Um, my thoughts are that um, when treating a, a population, especially the most vulnerable populations, I think we need to be uh, closer in regards to services that are provided to them. Um, I understand there will be some people without transportation using using uh, this, this treatment center and um, 
looking at other other services around the city, this this uh, new center could be potentially miles away from others. So for people who might be uh, only have a bike or might be walking with all of their belongings, this can be a, a prohibitive uh, step for getting the right amount of treatment. Um, you know, just looking at it looks like it could be over two miles away from some parts of town where other services are, and that could take all day for someone to go there and back. Why don't we go to uh, Mr. Dodd, if you want to please take that question. And if you don't mind, just a uh, very brief recap of the question. Um, if I understood, nice, we spoke on the phone earlier, didn't we? Um, nice to meet you in person. So I think the recap of the question was, I'm going to slow down a little bit, because um, I'm not up there anymore. In the sighting of the clinic, um, given that it is a couple of miles away from um, Old Town, how are particularly homeless people who may need to access the clinic going to get there? Um, I think that's a summary of the question, Mike. Um, if we look at um, our other clinics in the state, um, only between 5 and 10% of our patients are homeless, which may come as a surprise to many people in this room. Um, so I'm not saying that, oh, well, it's only 5 or 10%, so we don't have to worry about them. We have to worry about everybody. Um, but it's, 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 not, it's, not a, it's not a huge percentage. And in citing a clinic, you have to, you know, you have to weigh up pros and cons of every, of every location. And for us, I think as we've heard from everybody today, um, you know, this is a medical problem. And therefore, um, Austin, to be able to cite the clinic on a medical campus within striking range of the hospital and other resources is, is very important. I think for those that are coming from a couple of miles away, one of the good things about 2800 Harris is it is on a good bus route. Um, and uh, although you know, we can't promise anything, I think one of the things we can look at is let's see if we can help organize some transport for people from downtown. Uh, I know that other program operators do that, uh, and it's something we've been looking at. So I think we can, I'm not promising that we're going to operate a daily shuttle to Old Town, but it's something that we could, we could look at. But it is on a bus route, and only 5 to 10% five to of our census in the other clinics we operate is, is homeless. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilman, any other follow-up on that? But I, I do think that, uh, Councilman, I think that Mr. Dodd and the Councilman and obviously the Councilwoman uh, we'll be getting together probably to discuss uh, a lot further as well. So thank you so much. Before we go to our next question uh, for the panel that's in front of us, we'd like to be able to see if we have any questions uh, for Dr. Mark or uh, Mr. Nielsen. If we don't have any further questions, we're going to let them go for the evening. Uh, and then we're going to go to Mr. Madrone as well, and I appreciate his patience. But uh, we want to see if we have any questions. We do have one. Alex, if you want to uh, just, uh, we would like to be able to uh, Point the question to. Sure. Uh, to Mr. Nielsen. So you were speaking about, uh, I can't remember, it's, it's a bill that is potentially going to be moving through in regard to the sober living spaces, sober houses. Um, the things that you mentioned, um, loud music, um, excessive cars, um, people smoking on the porch out front, uh, those are things that happen regardless if it's a sober living home. And in particular, up here in Humboldt, uh, we have a huge issue with housing, regardless if you're um, in poverty, low income, working class, or of means. So I would love for you to comment further or for any of our elected officials to comment on um, why would we treat folks and target folks that are in recovery when we should be focusing on everyone at, at large. Um, everyone deserves affordable, healthy, and safe housing. And I have plenty of friends, and I'm newer to the area, only a little over a year, that are living in abhorrent conditions. Um, their landlords are not present, um, even if they do live locally. So I just think it's unfair to hold folks um, in recovery to a different standard than we're holding folks that are just living here as other residents. No, thank you so much, Alex. And Mr. Nielsen, I'm going to keep your answer to about two minutes, if you don't mind, and we're going to turn it over to Mr. Nielsen. Thank you for your question. Um, I totally agree with you. It definitely is important to have affordable housing. 
Um, and yes, it's unfair that people focus. I mean, yes, there's neighbors that have loud music. Yes, there's neighbors that smoke on their porch. But because um, that there is individuals living together and sometimes people, you know, do focus on them. And, and I think that it's important for um, those uh, recovery residents to, you know, be an asset to the community and, and be above uh, reproach in, in those areas. And I think that if they're responsible as far as uh, a neighbor, then they will take into consideration how they affect the neighborhood. And I think that, that that's the important, and it's part of recovery. I mean, that's, that's the lessons of recovery as far as, as you know, being an, a, an asset and giving back and, and, and being, you know, a responsible member of society. Those are principles of recovery. And so I think that it's important that, you know, um, for, you know, individuals that live in those homes because, yes, your call has been disconnected. Goodbye. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, RIP that hamster. So uh, that was awkward. I do. Uh, so Alex, um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have Rob Christensen give uh, Alex his card. And we are going to connect Mr. Nielsen with Alex so we can get her the answer next week. And Alex, I apologize about that as well. So uh, we're going to go to Mr. Madrone with our next question. And again, Alex, I am so sorry uh, that we lost the signal. So um, I really apologize. We're going to go to Mr. Madrone for our next question. Uh, thank you, Senator McGuire, and uh, also Supervisor Bass. Uh, first, I want to thank you for pulling this together and for the community getting so involved in this very important issue. I'm also really thankful to see the conversation starting to turn from just being talking about uh, symptoms to starting to talk about underlying causes. Uh, and starting to see so much compassion coming out of the community because there are many in our community that are very reactionary to these things and think, well, let's just lock them all up. They're a bunch of bums or whatever. And really, they're victims. I think we in this room know that, that most people that are addicted are victims. And they're victims of a pharmaceutical uh, industry and distribution industry that is preying on our communities. So I want to thank the Board of Supervisors for taking the bold move on uh, Tuesday, just two days ago, to support the lawsuit against pharmaceutical corporations, because that's where the cause begins. You know, it, it begins with handing out these uh, prescription drugs as candy, and then good people managing pain or other things can end up addicted, and then their prescriptions run out, so what do they do? They still have the pain, now they're addicted, so they go to the streets. Then they lose their jobs, they lose their homes, and what do we want to do? Call them criminals and throw them in jail? And according to the sheriff, we're spending $80,000 a year putting people in prison. $60,000 a year on homeless. How is that a solution no matter what party you belong to? So I want to applaud the board for taking the action the other day and trying to start the discussion about these drugs that are being passed out like candy by pharmaceuticals that are making huge profits off of our misery in our communities. I don't support that. I support long-term cause analysis and treatment, and I do support all the other stuff we're dealing with on the symptomatic end. But if we think that's going to solve it without dealing with the underlying cause, we really need to wake up. So thank you for what you're doing here. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Superv Supervisor Bass, back to you. If you don't mind, just state your first name, sir. My name is Brian, and this question is aimed towards someone from uh, Waterfront Recovery Services. Um, all too often, I hear uh, people suffering from addiction calling uh, Waterfront Recovery Services and being told there's no beds available. And through further inquiry, I understand that that's not always exactly the case, but it sometimes has to do with funding and funding aimed towards beds and funding that people are um, eligible for. So I was wondering if you could explain that a little bit better and also tell us a little bit about uh, billing for Medi-Cal, which is coming, I understand, and how that might change the landscape of how you're going to be serving folks with addiction. Oh, hang on one second, doctor. We're going to need to figure out that mic. 
Doctor, I'm going to have you uh, just head on up over to the podium real quick. And we'll, we'll here we go. Doctor, head over to the podium. Okay, Ms. McManus, you want to head over to the podium then? Mr. McManus, if you don't mind introducing yourself as well. So, there we go. You're all right. <laughs> Sorry. I'm John McManus. I'm the Executive Director of Waterfront Recovery Services and Alcohol Drug Care Services. So, like Ginger mentioned before, no beds available is all about funding. So, Waterfront Recovery Services currently has contracts with Humboldt County DHHS. Um, we take clients through AB 109. Um, Del Norte, we have a contract with them. We'll soon be bringing Measure Z funding online. And for the beds you're probably concerned with, it would be more Measure Z funding. So uh, with the drug med medical certification as part of the broader drug um, DMC ODS, or drug medical organized delivery system, all of the programs, HRC, Crossroads, we are all working on being drug medical certified. And as mentioned, we have submitted our application. Hopefully it will be less time than nine months to a year. But once that comes online, anybody that has medical would have access to treatment. So I would imagine all drug medical certified programs would be running at full capacity. Okay, does that answer? And I'm, I'm hoping I got all of your question. For, I, it could be, yeah, I don't want to paint too rosy a picture. So, but we, it's, it's been an extraordinary amount of work. And, and I have to applaud all the treatment programs in the area for working towards this. The certification standards will raise the level of clinical care that we're providing for all the residents. And I just have to say, well done, Virginia and Senator McGuire. This is... A lot of questions have been answered, and it feels like we are actually taking a team approach to this. And it's really nice to see, so thanks. Thank you so much. We're gonna come, uh, come right over here, and then we have a question right over there, Supervisor. We'll come to you next, uh, and we're gonna turn it right over. If you don't mind, just give us your first name. I'm Liana. I wanted to respond to Alex's concerns about housing. And since we have a senator in the room and lots of politicians, California is becoming unhoused in the rest of the country. I'm trying to move by my grandkids, and I'm not exact, you know, I've worked hard for 30 years holding a business, and it is very difficult to move south of Humboldt County in California. California is losing lots of residents because of housing. A lot of my senior friends are moving to Arizona, for example. So I think that housing is a big part of this entire issue. We know people can't get housed, they can't get well. And so I would like to see some focus from the professionals on what we're gonna do statewide to make housing more affordable. Thank you. No, and I, I appreciate absolutely, uh, just if it's okay with folks, just very quickly on the issue of housing. Um, when we take a look at California, California is number one in the United States in job growth three straight years in a row. The problem that we have, and why we're starting to see a slowdown in our economy, as you had just mentioned, there are not enough homes to be able to house those individuals who want to be able to go to work. Um, and we have two acute crises happening all at the same time. Number one, not enough uh, workforce housing. Uh, and then number two, we have a homeless crisis on the streets every night. 114,000 residents call the streets of California home each day. 114,000, 22% of the nation's homeless population. So there are some focus areas. Number one, there will be a $4 billion affordable housing bond focused on workforce housing moving forward this fall. Uh, there will be a guarantee that smaller communities in rural counties will have an automatic carve out of $300 million. We fought hard for that to make sure that counties like Humboldt don't have to compete against counties like Los Angeles or even Sonoma. Number two, the county of Humboldt 
uh, in the next approximately 12 months, we'll be receiving uh, approximately $2 million to be able to invest in permanent homeless housing that will be wrapped with services, mental health, and drug and alcohol addiction. They'll then be able to compete for additional $21 million in a competitive bucket uh, going against like-sized counties. But what I will share with you, we are nearly 2 million homes short of where we need to be over the last 10 years. We need to build 180,000 units every year to keep pace. We have not even broken 100,000 over the last seven years. And we didn't build a million units during the recession. So we're approaching about 2 million short. So it's, it's, it's going to be a long time, uh, but we're starting to really focus in on that. In uh, San Luis Obispo County, we're, we're hoping to move a building permit costs over $175,000. So before you even stick a shovel in the ground. And I think that's another thing that, you know, our politicians need to address. Why are building permits preventing contractors from being able to even build? That's an issue. Oh, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm grateful you're here and thank you for sharing the concern. And it is uh, a really significant one in every part of the state. Let's go to Supervisor Bass. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Hunter. I am a Southern Humboldt resident. I wanted to remark that I don't recognize any faces in this room from Southern Humboldt County. Can, can I see a show of hands? Who's from Soham? Two people. Three people. Okay. That gives you a little bit of an idea of what kind of situation we're in in Southern Humboldt. The apathy, the lack of community concern, and the feeling of hopelessness where we are regionally. The scenario on the street in Redway and Garberville and the surrounding areas is something out of, the, it's unimaginable. It's worse than you could even imagine. It's beyond the movies. I'm filming a documentary right now called Lifting the Redwood Curtain, and it's, it's an expose about all the different social epidemics that we're facing here in this county, in this region. And I want to emphasize that the problem the root of this problem is mental health, undoubtedly. <laughs> Homicide, domestic violence, missing persons, suicide, drug addiction, they're all rooted in mental health. We have a mental health crisis on our hands, and that's what we need to address first and foremost before we're going to solve the big picture. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Hunter. Very grateful and well said. Uh, very good, and thank you for coming uh, and making the trek north here and looking forward to getting together tomorrow. All right, we're coming right over. Hey, it's good to see you again. Thank you for being here. All right, Doc, go right ahead. Uh, my name's Joe Fox, and I'm a student at the College of the Redwoods, and I would like to revisit the question the councilman brought up and the answer that Mr. Dodd gave, and, um, and that was that you have only 5 to 10 percent of your patients are homeless in your other clinics. And I might suggest that that's because they can't get there. And I would also like to suggest that it should be higher. And it will only be higher if the effort is made to reach them. And if you take the easy ones because they pay, that is not the right answer. But if you want to talk about homelessness, please. Um, f fair point on not wanting to sort of self-select out of treating the homeless. Um, so I think it just echoes what Austin said, and maybe we have to think of a way to reach um, the folk in Old Town. Regarding their payment, um, there are three ways that patients um, are able financially to be treated in a clinic such as ours. Uh, one is that they pay themselves or their family members pay. The other is that their insurance or family insurance covers it, but I take the point about rising premiums. Um, the majority of our patients are covered by Medi-Cal. So if a homeless person um, is eligible for Medi-Cal, and I would imagine many of them are because they earn less than the threshold money required, then the payment is not an issue. We're not self-selecting out of it by not wanting to take people who cannot pay. They are, the homeless would be covered by Medi-Cal, so it's not, a, it's not a payment issue. So 
Sorry, say that last bit again. It's an it effort. Is an issue of effort, concern, and compassion. Um, I don't think it is. I don't think it's an effort of compassion. Um, I, I think the distance can make it difficult for some homeless to get to the clinic. I think that's a fair point. Let's go to Supervisor Bass, and then we have another question right over here. We have time for about another 10 minutes, if that's okay with everyone, 10 minutes. Uh, please, let's go right over here to Supervisor Bass, and we welcome you. Chanel, my name is Chanel. And um, again, talking about the homeless, um, both um, Chief Watson and Connie Beck mentioned the dispersal of the marsh um, camps and the, the negative effect of that. Um, today, the city council, Eureka City Council, was in um, and strategizing, and they really didn't want to talk about what to do about the homeless. Um, I really think that the, there's a lot of people there that that are addicted. There's a lot of people that aren't. Um, they're, they spread across the entire spectrum. But the thing that they don't have is they, they don't have dignity. And uh, they need a place where they can live in dignity. And I think that, that I hope that the county has taken a step, and I hope that the city will join them and to provide a place for, of dignity for the homeless. Thank you. So. Thank you so much, Chief. We're going to hear uh, from the Councilwoman, then we're going to go to uh, Chief Watson, please. And we also have the Councilman if you want to say a few words. Councilwoman, if you just want to introduce yourself, please. Yeah, well, thank you all for being here tonight. I think this has been a really eye-opening experience. Um, I do want to just speak for one moment about <laughs> what I just heard. Um, I think it's really important to realize that in our city and in our council, we are constantly working on solutions for homelessness. We're constantly talking to people about homelessness. We're constantly talking to personally homeless people. What can we do to support people out of that? So the idea that we weren't wanting or willing to talk about that I think might be um, a misperception at best um, for, from that meeting. Um, I too, um, let's see. So I have some concerns also and um, and one is the, the distance, but it also, um, I was speaking to somebody earlier today who had said something about um, that uh, the methadone was in place because there wasn't funding, the drug medical hadn't come in yet, and that for some reason those people, like the homeless people, weren't being funded that way. And I'm curious if that's actually the truth or if I misheard something because that, um, certainly doesn't make much sense and doesn't speak to what you were saying. So if it works uh, for Mr. Dodd, uh, before we go to Mr. Dodd, just want to see if Chief Watson wants to uh, jump in on this uh, question in regards to homelessness, and we'll go straight over. Then we're going to go straight over to Mr. Dodd. So Chief Watson, anything you would like to be able to mention? Thank you, Senator. I didn't actually hear a question and all that, but uh, Council Member Miguel, I think, answered uh, um, regard in regards to the tremendous amount of time and effort and energy the city has spent over the last several years uh, trying to come up with solutions to a very very difficult problem uh, to solve and that's homelessness in our inner city and in our county thank you so much and if we can go to mr. Dodd on the council members question please um, okay I think I've understood what it is um, I don't whether it's you're, whether you're misinformed or it was a mistruth or what, put that to one side. I think the situation um, when the clinic opens, and I, I didn't have enough time to talk about when the clinic opens. Mike said this year, fingers crossed it'll be December. Um, not April like our other clinics, we always seem to open new clinics in. Um, at, by then, by then, um, Humboldt County will be, um, along with either seven or eight other counties will be through the drug medic, the medica, the drug medical um, ODS waiver regional plan with partnership for health. Um, and Connie can talk about when that hopefully will happen. But I think there's a, a very good chance that all that will happen before the clinic opens. That will mean that any drug medical patients who come to the clinic, Kim, together with their doctor will have the 
choice of whether the, the best medication for them is buprenorphine or methadone. Hmm. And the patient will not know the difference in cost. And the doctor won't either. We don't, you know, that, that decision is made about what is the best medication for them is made between the doctor and the patient with neither of them really knowing the cost of it. So that it will not be an issue. Today, if, um, if a, if a medical patient goes to open door, whether they're homeless or employed, mm -hmm. but they're still medical, medical covers the cost of buprenorphine through the pharma, what is known as the pharmacy benefit. When it's through the clinic, such as ours, it's known as going through the drug medical formulary. But when the clinic opens, um, bup and methadone um, will be available to the patient, and the patient won't know that how it, how it happens. So it's, yeah. it's either a, it, whether it's a misconception or whatever. So yeah, so, so my Councilman, concern. really quick, I just want to make sure, because we have other uh, folks. Just real quick? Like, very quick. Real quick. So real quick, um, you know, when you speak to the solutions for our community, this is another one of my concerns, is that when I think of um, our community and what they look at as addiction, we need to support people that are out on the streets that are addicted. I mean, certainly we need to support people, all people, but the people on the streets are the ones that the community feels like are causing all the problems. So those are the people that are gonna be um, of maximum benefit to our city, uh, not that other people won't be. And so I guess I just wanna be clear that those, that needs to be addressed very, um, it's very important to address those as well and make those services available for those folks that are out there. Um, I, I, I agree. And at the same time, anyone who comes to the clinic um, and is eligible for treatment um, I'm not going to triage them whether they're homeless or uh, the daughter of somebody or my daughter. Thank you so much. We're going to be going to, thank you so much, Councilwoman. Thank you, Mr. Dodd. We're going to go to our next question, if you don't mind just introducing yourself. And here we go. Uh, Leslie Hunt from Hoopa, Kamal Medical Center Board of Directors. Um, I just wanted to thank you. Uh, take some consideration into the allocation of funding. Um, like the gentleman said over on the south, uh, Southern Humboldt, the Eastern District is often overlooked and very severely underfunded. You think about the nation suffering from mental health, I believe that is really one of the key points, but the nation suffers from clinicians, which means State of California suffers, and then you break it down to Humboldt and you break it down even further to Hoopla. Um, Kamal Medical Center sees over 3,000 patients within the year, not that they come in daily, but they do, see, they do seek treatment from our facility. Tribal membership is just under 2,300, so that means we serve those who are non-tribal, who are in our community, because we care. We know that the value of treating patients, um, whether they're tribal or non, they're in our community, and we know that the health is a benefit to all of us. But with that said, some of the infrastructure that is lacking is just mere transportation. We currently have no grocery store. We're going on two years with no grocery store. Um, we talk about the health. That's key to dealing with, uh, I'm so sorry, addiction. Because if you can't build your muscles, you can't go out and do work. It's not realistic. Um, so allocating funds to uh, housing, we can't find professional housing in our area. Not only is our membership seeking housing, we have homelessness there too. And it's tough to see because we're so related. We're so intricately related. The, the um, not only the addictions, but the health of our community is suffering greatly. We have a, a whole myriad of diabetes and hypertension and we have nowhere to seek treatment. And that's not only for Hoopa, and I realize that, that's Humboldt County, a lot of the specialists have moved away. And there's no money. The transportation just to get to see a doctor is non-existent. And so when you talk about you know, money for opioid treatment, I appreciate that greatly. But there's so much more that's needed just to get them in the door. And, and we really need to focus on how do we get them in the door. We, we can't provide transportation locally. We, we don't even know where they're at because there's not addresses in our area. So along with county and ambulance, we suffer with trying to find these people. Missing members, we have a lot of missing members. That's really true to a lot of things that are being brought into this county. So allocation of funding is key and looking at how we can do that. Thank you. Much. 
And I just want to point out, Kamau Medical Center in Hoopa, they have, uh, you talk about serving many rural communities uh, as you are traveling towards Trinity County and uh, with incredible staff, small but mighty. And we just want to say thank you so much. And we were just meeting uh, with uh, one of your council members here earlier today, along with your medical director. And I know uh, Hoopa's going to want to be able to have a conversation uh, with uh, Mr. Dodd as well. So I uh, just want to say thank you so much. Anyone want to respond? Uh, because Native American people in this state have some of the highest um, addiction numbers uh, compared to uh, any other ethnicity in the state of California. I don't know if anyone else wants to be able to comment on that. All right, why don't we go and thank you so much and we will be getting that call set up as well. So thank you. Let's go over to the supervisor. We're gonna come right over here. Yeah, I'd like to bring the conversation back to Southern Humboldt really quick and I was hoping that someone on the panel could maybe talk a little bit about the new treatment center that's down in Redway at the Redwood, Redwoods Rural Health Center. I'm Nate. My, my colleague, Dr. Judson Lee, can talk about that. I'm not a doctor, first of all. Uh, thank you, Alex. I have to disclaimer. Um, we're very excited that Redwoods Rural is the first spoke in Humboldt County. Um, and they Gets a little their, louder, please. They started their MAT program this week. They're admitting patients with suboxone and behavioral counseling uh, in partnership with Singing Trees as well. We're very excited also to talking um, to Southern Trinity um, uh, that they have joined as spokes as well for both the, for both the Scotia and Mad River locations. So we're excited to help um, Southern, Southern Humboldt as well. So much. We're going to be coming over to Trish with her next question. Hi, I'm an HSU social work student, and I would be remiss in my education if I did not point out that it is um, often that addiction is attributed to underlying trauma that was uh, not addressed. And to piggyback on the gentleman from SOHUM, I want to um, encourage people and find solutions on finding more trauma-informed providers and clinicians that will take Medi-Cal in our area and serve the population this way. I also want to thank you for inviting HRC and Crossroads to the next forum and also want to encourage you to have a tribal representation at the next forum because I think that community really needs to be served. They are disproportionately um, affected. They are disproportionately in our jails and um, often with addic addictions, um, underlying addiction problems, and I think that really needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trish. <laughs> Supervisor Bass and Tom. My name is Tom with Redwood Teen Challenge, and I just want to remind everybody that uh, medication-based treatment isn't the only way. Faith-based treatment is effective. If you look at the results, um, Teen Challenge has over 100 beds here in Humboldt County. And also the rescue mission has over 100 beds. There's a lot happening in faith-based and almost all of those programs are nearly free. And so don't think that that's the only solution, that there are other solutions out there. One thing I'd like to say about Teen Challenge is uh, before you judge us, I won't believe everything I've heard about you if you don't believe everything you've heard about me. There we go. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dodd. Uh, you want to respond to that real quick? I did. Um, I'm glad you raised that. What, one of the things that we um, are often asked is, you know, is, is your program better than faith-based or abstinence-based or whatever? And, and, and the answer is no, because, it, because addiction is such a complex disease and patients are at different stages in their recovery. All, every single patient is at a different stage in their recovery. Um, the more modalities there are, the better. There can't be enough different modalities. So I'm well done for raising the, the faith-based one. And all of us, as different treatment providers, we just fit into that continual matrix. And you know, for, for, one t for one patient, our one may be better. For another patient, your one may be better. Um, and then next year, they relapse, and someone may come from our program to your program. It doesn't matter. And unfortunately, Mike, the problem is so damn big, there's room for everybody. Thank you so much. Let's go to McKay. So I'm a, I, I, work with, I work with Betty Chin's uh, Blue Angels 
Um, for those of you who are not familiar, she provides a lot of services to homeless individuals and just really anyone that needs to help get their life together. Um, homelessness is obviously a huge issue, and it's it's part of this opioid crisis that we're we're seeing in this community. Um, I don't know if it was uh, if it was the last opioid crisis meeting or if it was another town hall meeting, but it was uh, discussed. But we were talking about. Um, putting forward a center for homeless individuals to come and meet, um, and I think that was the Runeberg Hall, in, right down the road from Costco. Um, and a lot of a lot of community members expressed their uh, discomfort with that, with having sort of a center. For um, I th I'm today being here and, and hearing uh, the suggestions from people. There seems to be this interesting dichotomy where we, we, uh, we want this, this homeless crisis to be addressed, but we're not, it seems like we're not, as community members, willing to, to do our part as individuals walking on the street, you know, saying hi to these homeless individuals and really asking what they need. Um, and I think that this is, it's kind of a difficult thing for, the, you know, the elected representatives to say, you need to do your part, but as a citizen, um, you know, working with these homeless individuals, one of the biggest complaints in any major city is that um, these homeless individuals deal with uh, isolation and feeling alone. And that's really strange to think that in these large cities, um, isolation would be a thing, but in reality, people recognize who the homeless individuals are and they shun them out. You know, they don't want to, they don't want to help, they don't want to be involved directly in their life. And as, as a person who's lived here for a little while, I would really like to see um, each, everyone that's here, that obviously has come and cares about this community, to really put forward an effort into having a conversation with those on the street, having you know, a, a real dialogue about what we need as, as citizens, as homeless people, as, as community members. And that, this, that would translate really into, into uh, a, a better solution, one of the best solutions that we can, we can uh, have in addressing this crisis overall. Much McKay, thank you. <laughs> Supervisor, we're gonna go to our next question and we have time for a couple more. We have a gentleman right here and then we'll have uh, the councilman. Hi, my name's Jack. I'm one of the injured people. Been injured twice. Degenerative injuries, both of them. It's stronger as I get older, the pain. I was cut off two years ago. Last month, I called my claims examiner, and she said we'll extend the radius to 150 miles to try to find you a doctor. I called each doctor. Four of them said it will depend on the case. You can send your case to us. The others said no. They wouldn't accept any workers' comp. And so uh, that's all I have to say. This is, uh, you know, I hope it uh, helps people that are addicted. I've been on uh, pain pills since 27. And when I was shut off two years ago, I didn't break out in any sweat or Jones or any of that, but I have a lot of pain. It's with me all the time. Just want to say thank you uh, for your willingness to be able to stand up and share your story as well. And we are so grateful that you're here tonight. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. We're going to go to our uh, next question. Welcome, sir. Hi, I'm Ray. Uh, I work as a nurse with Open Door. I've been doing the MAT program for a fair amount of time with Dr. Onimus. Thank you all for coming out here. I think it's a huge benefit that we all have uh, this goal to help this crisis. My angle is that um, I've started many, many people who use heroin onto buprenorphine. And I'd have to say that the amount of fentanyl that I hear about on the streets is at crisis proportions. And what I don't hear is any type of response, whether it be state, federal, or or anything along those lines that um, is kind of tracking that. I feel as though we spend a lot of money on war at this time, and I feel that this is 
a national security issue, to tell you the truth. If it's coming from overseas, I think that we should have um, entities tracking this type of substance. Because almost everyone I start who has been using things off the street, like heroin, they've hit the fentanyl. It's out there, and it's um, taking a record number of people from our lives. So that might be something for Washington, perhaps, but I just wanted to bring that up because I'm really seeing a lot of that, and it's, it's heartbreaking. Thank you for your work at Open Door. Please, let's go to Ms. Kerr, and then if any one of our medical professionals also would like to be able to comment on this on the issue of fentanyl, let's go to Ms. Kerr. Hello. There we go. Just want to thank Ray for bringing that up and mention that uh, since last June, Hatcher's been distributing fentanyl testing strips. Um, and just to speak to the to the volume of the problem, um, in June through December of last year, we had 150 positive tests for fentanyl in substances. So um, it is a serious issue and uh, something we need to pay close attention to. Thank you. Anyone else would like to be able to, thank you so much, Ms. Kerr. Anyone else on the issue of fentanyl? Why don't we go to our uh, next question with the councilwoman. First of all, thank you all for being here tonight and for taking such a great interest in your community. Um, we really try very hard to serve this community and I believe that we all care about our community. So thank you for being that caring community. One of the questions that I had in regard to this is there's been a lot of studies since the 90s that have come out in regard to the high malleability of the brain and how that adaptability is related and how you guys are, um, how, what, what you're doing with that relationship to behavior and malleability of the brain, how that's a part of the treatments. Um, because that's one of the things that changes the long-term brain function. And we talked multiple times about some of the mental health issues that are happening and the malleability of the brain, the adaptability of the brain is really important. And when we see that generational mental health issues, but we're not addressing that change in the brain that we could, do, could actually do through some be behavior. I know someone mentioned that, um, the nurture and the nature. So do you guys have something specifically you work with the behavior as well as I, the medical? Dog up. Yeah. Certainly, as part of our program, we have a very intensive psychosocial component. Um, in the first phase, people are meeting weekly with our counselors, and then we have the ability to uh, refer for individual counseling as well. And I totally agree. I think counseling works as well as drugs uh, in terms of changing some of the brain function. Uh, but we fully believe that medication is not just the simple answer at all. And uh, we're always in need of more substance abuse counselors uh, and just reaching out to people. I don't know if you want to add anything. I just would like to, um, again, rehash the fact that uh, mental health uh, illness and substance abuse illness have genetic predispositions. And so it's really important that we educate our folks. And in terms of uh, rehabilitating the brain, uh, it takes a biopsychosocial model to do that. It, not only medication, not only psychological, but uh, uh, other aspects like family interventions and so on. But before we can rehab the, the brain, we have to make sure that the offending substance is out. Thank you very much. We have uh, two last questions. We're going to go right over here. Thank you, ma'am, into the councilman, and then we're going to uh, have some closing remarks. Ma'am, straight over to you with Supervisor Bass. Okay. Uh, my name is Nezi, and I've heard some conversation around uh, issues for people being isolated and uh, mental health issues, drug addiction, all those things, and few of the population in these, in ages, for example, being homeless. We have 
uh, the homeless in our area are a significant factor in addressing this crisis. And until we can provide some stability so they can be in place somewhere 24-7, we're not going to be able to address that population. And so uh, I know we have the ability to do this. I know we're, we have a shelter crisis declaration. We know we have to create some space and open that up. And we know we have willing parties, nonprofits, people who are willing to help manage and supervise and, and make those things happen. We really need to move in the direction of stabilizing people who are isolated and then disassociate and make it impossible for us to do much of anything. So thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. We're grateful. We're going to be wrapping it up with the councilman. We're going to invite each of our panelists to be able to make any uh, short 30-second closing comments uh, here in just a bit. Then we'll turn it over to the supervisor, and we'll go straight to the councilman. Um, hey, I just want to touch back on the housing issue because, uh, you know, living in a socioeconomically depressed area, it does, um, having a very high cost of living can and does contribute to uh, addiction, unfortunately, and it can also uh, make a huge barrier in regards to people uh, getting getting out of the you know the cracks that they fall into because they don't have housing. Um, you know, in the last few months, the city council has been working very hard on trying to address uh, housing issues, such as updating our zoning codes to allow more mother-in-law units. We we recently voted for and approved 85 new units of affordable housing to be built on city-owned property. And we're also working on, uh, on multiple units of transitional housing um, that, that is still being worked on with the Coastal Commission. Um, I just realized that you know, to, to have a good quality of life, one shouldn't spend more than half of their uh, disposable income on housing. I believe you should spend less than 25% of your disposable income on housing in a perfect society. And that's not happening. It's not happening in Eureka. It's not happening in Humboldt. It's not happening in California. But I, I just know that the city council members for Eureka are extremely committed to providing uh, solutions towards the housing crisis. And if you'd like to come tomorrow to our second day for our visioning plan for the year, um, that's one of the biggest issues. Uh, the three issues we, we identified to work on for this year was homelessness, housing, and more economic development because they're all related. Oh, uh, 8.30, 830 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. at the Warfinger um, on the waterfront. Thank you so much, uh, Councilman. And we do want to say thank you to uh, all the council members who are here tonight, along with our sheriff and the judge uh, and all of our elected officials, Superintendent Hartley as well. Uh, before we go to closing comments, there's a, a few thank yous that I'd like to be able to advance. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to the amazing team who helped uh, put this uh, forum on tonight, and that is uh, from our office, and that's Carrie and Rob and Tete and Jessica, Jamal and Tom, uh, and we are so grateful for their work. Rob Christensen is right here in Eureka. We can give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. Um, we also want to say thank you to uh, our media team uh, tonight as they have been working overtime uh, and uh, doing a little sweating. So I uh, do appreciate truly uh, to Dana and to Brian and Phil and Doug who is here in-house. I want to say thank you so much to our Senate sergeants who are here tonight along with the California Highway Patrol. Let's give them a highway, uh, a highway patrol. Let's give them. I've been told that it's a half price ticket night tonight. Am I right for the CHP? All right, thumbs up. Thank you so much. Good stuff. Um, and before we turn it over to uh, Supervisor Bass, we'd like to better turn it over to our panel for any closing comments that you may have. Uh, I'll start with the fantastic team and Dr. Julie uh, from Open Door. If any comments that you may have, to be able to close this out. I think um, we're in a time of a lot of hope. I really feel like we're starting to put some on the ground as far as a coalition in, in just uh, offering a multi-level worth of care. Um, and so between all that has been in HRC and Crossroads and now Waterfront and certainly Open Door as well as Aegis, I really think we're entering a time where there's going to be a lot of gateways into uh, substance use treatment. Thank you so much, Doctor. And I do want to say thank you to Open Door for all the work. Let's go to Mr. Dodd, please. Um, thank you, Mike. Thank you very much, everybody. I think the only thing 
I would add is um, please come up with lots of uh, intelligent ideas on how we can use this grant funding. Um, it is a, a blessing um, and it really will make a difference in the rural areas like Redway and, and Scotia and others. Um, there are, uh, like any federal uh, funding, it does come with lots of strings attached. So the funding can only be used for certain categories of expenditure. But the DHCS in Sacramento is fantastic to work with on this, and they will bend the rules as much as possible. So even They'll be innovative, got, innovative. <laughs> as much as possible. There so come up with crazy ideas and say, oh, we need to spend some on youth development. Um, Stuart, whatever it may be, uh, all, the worst that can happen is there is a polite, I'm afraid we can't do that. Um, so whether it's to Judson or Sarah or any of the team here, um, you know, please come up with ideas on how to use this, this grant money. Thank you so much. Let's go to Dr. Ruby. It takes a village, and I'm so glad that you're all here. This is how we're going to solve this problem. Waterfront will always be there to help out. And I would also would like to thank our partners, Open Door, Aegis, Mental Health, Law Enforcement, and thank you, Supervisor Bass, and thank you, Senator McGuire. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's go to uh, Ms. Beck. I'm not sure why I didn't add this previously, but um, we are, the county is establishing a housing fund and task force. I think it's going to the board on the 10th of April. Um, there will be representation from each supervisor's district on that task force, um, plus a member of the planning department and also um, the homeless and housing coalition. So. Um, we are super hopeful at this time that we will be, um, you know, moving forward with some good housing strategies. So looking forward to that. Sorry I didn't bring it up earlier. No, it's a good way to and end. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much, Ms. Beck. Let's go to Chief Watson, please. Yeah, I just, uh, I guess what I'll leave with tonight is I am impressed with the sense of optimism and uh, collaboration in this room. Um, you know, we recognize in law enforcement that we can't and we shouldn't um, arrest our way out of some of the problems that we've been discussing tonight, homelessness and addiction and so on and so forth. Um, obviously, we have to deal with the symptoms and behaviors of a much larger problem. That's kind of by the nature of law enforcement. It's what, what we do. Um, you know, someone is attacking someone else because they're under the influence of crystal meth you know, there's a role that we need to play. Um, but we also, you know, recognize that we find ourselves increasingly in the difficult position of what I call policing the gaps in a very broken system. And so again, um, the collaborative efforts, the partnership, the communication to try to get our community to a better place than it was yesterday and that it is today is very, very vital for the health and future of our community and the people in our community. So thank you for that and I look forward to working together with all of you. Thank you so much, Chief. Very grateful for your work. <clears throat> Let's turn it over to Ms. Kerr for some closing comments. Uh, I would echo the gratitude that the rest of the panel has shared, and I would just add a comment that um, it's really heartening to hear the, the critical questions and comments that have been raised mm -hmm. tonight. Um, to have been done so with such compassion and an eye on the, the dignity and worth of the most vulnerable folks um, impacted by this epidemic. So thank you for that. Thank you, Ms. Kerr. And I want to take a moment to say thank you to Supervisor Bass. Uh, this has been a team effort, and uh, Supervisor Bass has been here in Humboldt leading the way on this significant challenge that all of us face every day. On behalf of the Board of Supervisors, I want to turn it over to the supervisor and say again, thank you so much for your partnership. All right, well, before I say my closing remarks, thank you so much for the partnership. Uh, we couldn't do it alone, and um, I hear other counties are wanting you to come visit them as well and do the same thing. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so, you know, we can't change where we've been or how we got there, but we, what we can change is where we go 
and how we get there. And there are so many people in this community working on this issue. They're making some great progress, you know, but we don't realize it. And I think we sell, our show, sell ourselves short. Um, I have to say I'm disheartened in some extent that I was hearing that people weren't going to come tonight because they were saying it doesn't matter. And I have to wonder, are they really interested in solutions? So, you know, I hope you will tell everyone who wasn't here tonight that it does matter. I want to thank all of you, whether, you know, there's a mix of group, mix of people in here, and I want to thank everyone who's in here for their attendance, because without you, it can't be done, and uh, we need everybody. So thank you so much for being here, and, um, and thank you also for pushing us to find solutions, because sometimes we need that extra nudge. So thank you. Thank you so much, Supervisor. And uh, I'll just end it here and say how grateful we are that you are back here for round two. But what I will share with you, there's a lot of work in front of us. Uh, but this change that we need in this community started in November by all of us working together. And what I will assure you that is if we're not working together, we are going to fail. And this is going to be one of the biggest issues that we will face in generations because this is one of the biggest crises this county has faced, as well as our country has faced in generations. And I can't say thank you enough to all of our providers who are here today. Uh, and what I promised you, and as the supervisor has promised you last time, we will make sure that we have each of the providers who are doing the fantastic work on the ground here, bringing change to our communities at our next forum. In addition, we'll make sure that we also have a tribal representative uh, here uh, representing the important native population of Humboldt County. Um, but I'll end it as I ended it before. The easiest approach that all of us could take is a cynical one, and that's turning our backs. It's really easy to be able to attack each other on Facebook or Twitter. But what's hard, what's hard is actually bringing change to Humboldt County. But together, together we're going to do this. Uh, and it is not going to be easy. But we have to continue to look forward. And there are very few communities, as I said before, that have had the courage to be able to stand up and have these difficult conversations. But there is a community, there is a county that has, and that's Humboldt. We're going to continue to push forward. We're going to hold each other accountable. We're going to come back this summer, early fall, to be able to report on our progress because we owe it to the future of the North Coast. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We look forward to working with you in the months and years to come. Thank you so much.